Coming to you from the TLD studios in Temecula, California, it's the Whiskey Throttle Show. Taking you deep inside the lives of the legends and leaders of our sport. This week's guest is brought to you by Yamaha, the leaders in the power sports industry. Motocross bikes, street bikes, adventure bikes, side-by-sides, quads, boats, generators. Yamaha sets the standard. Yamaha revs your heart. Method Race Wheels, the strongest, lightest, fastest wheels in off-road. Method dominates the off-road market with wheels for your truck, sprinter, Jeep, or UTV. Go to methodracewheels.com forward slash whiskey throttle for 20% off your order. Troy Lee Designs. Built for the world's fastest racers, TLD blends elite level protection with industry leading style and performance. Moto, bike, helmet paint, casual wear, whatever your passion, Troy Lee Designs is waiting for you on the next level. Nihilo Concepts enhance your riding experience with superior products like the Start Stop Conversion Kit, Fuel Pet Cocks, Frame Grip Tape, Lever Grip, Grip Donuts, Secondary On Switch, Billet Foot Pegs billet throttle housings, and so much more. The Hilo Concepts produces exceptional products, all of which are made right here in America. And by SKDA. SKDA is the ultimate destination for exceptional motocross graphics, customer service, and artistic excellence. Trust them to elevate your ride and showcase your individuality on the track, making every ride an exceptional experience. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Whiskey Throttle Show. Appreciate you guys tuning in. I'm your host, David Pingree, and uh, we've got a guest today that I've known a long time. I guess it's been over 30 years. Probably. Uh, it's been a hot minute. Uh, we'll, we'll tell those stories of when we first met. Uh, but this guy has a pretty impressive resume, team manager, mechanic, uh, a national championship under his belt as team manager. It's pretty good, man. Not a lot of people can say that. Uh, you guys probably know him. It's the original K-Dub. Mr. Kenny Watson. Welcome to the show, bud. Thank you, David. That was pretty... Uh, you don't really realize how much has really been done until someone like you says it, you know? It's like, wow. Well, yeah. I mean, you uh, you won races, a, a race with Moto Triple X, but had a lot of success with those guys. And uh, yeah. then your time at Hart and Huntington, which I, I'm excited to talk about. Maybe not the results, but you guys definitely innovated in terms of activation and the... And the Hot, yeah. hot girls dancing on boxes. <laughs> yeah, there's been some good times, so that's for sure. But you finished it off with a championship with RCH. Yeah, and that's it's just crazy. crazy. I look back at it now, and I'm all, wow. Yeah, that's pretty that cool. Is, uh, you know, and the last thing that I really did in this thing was in this industry was with Kenny, and, you know, that was huge, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I take that for granted. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. It is what it is. But, you know, we were at the time, we and I probably still are, the only – team to win an outdoor national championship that is was self you know funded through the inside it wasn't like you know we were a factory team yeah yeah it's a good point it's true yeah so uh well we start all of our shows as you know kenny with the method race wheels front end chatter if you guys are in the market for wheels for your truck a sprinter van suv whatever utv um we get 20 percent off for you so go to methodracewheels.com forward slash whiskey throttle they'll send you a code for 20 percent off anything you guys want over there they're the lightest strongest fastest wheels in off-road so uh check them out uh, first question because not a, there's not a lot of people around anymore that can even relate to this but cards were big back in the 90s for better or worse and i want to know how much you lost or won playing nuts guts or three five seven, which were kind of the three games that we always played. You think? Are you up or down? Dude, down. Yeah, down. <laughs> I don't think I've ever won. <laughs> you know, maybe a hand here and there to keep me addicted to it. But I remember one trip going to to Japan for like three races. I lost my whole earnings going there. Like I came home broke. Hmm. And I was supposed to make all that money to pay bills when I got home, and I lost everything. Yeah. It was like almost $1,000 or something. And I was just like, oh, my God. This is, I'm an idiot. Yeah. Well, there used to be not, like weekly games at Sean Norfolk's. Did you ever go to those? Yeah. And, and then Schnell Brothers. Dino's, Dino's house. Yeah. Dino's house. <laughs> Dean Gibson's house. 
it was a problem for a while. Uh-huh. And, all, and the, the thing was, we would play on the flights to and from races. We'd well, be in different aisles, us. and we would just be like, here's what I got. What do you got? And show Dude, it, was, it was so bad. RL and myself, I remember one trip, me and Jerem, uh, Randy, he was driving your box van. I was driving Ty Birdwell's box van, and Shelly was with him at the time. And, dude... She would, he would shuffle, and she would shuffle, and I would see her shuffle. I'd pull up next to her. She'd hand me the cards, hand them back. Dude, it was, it was you're playing stupid. cards while you're driving. Down driving, the yeah, it was out of control. But uh, yeah, that and was Skip. Uh, Skip Norfolk actually had a book and because everyone the pots would get so big oh, so yeah. fast. You, no one had that kind IOU, of cash on yeah. them, and it was all IOUs. And there, people for years were walking around with, "Hey, I got your IOU. You got the money. You got money." I think the best story I have about the gambling was when we were in... Did you go to Mexico? Yeah. When we were on that bus? Were you on that I bus? I didn't. No, I flew home. I didn't do the bus okay. to like Puerto... Where'd you guys go? We, I think we went from or like... Puerto uh, Vallarta or something? Yeah, we went from Monterey, Monterey, Mexico to Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. And the guy said it was only like four, three or four hours. And it ended up being like 12 hours. And we were playing cards, of course. And... Of course, I lost, <laughs> and Denny lost, and I was sitting across from Denny. Everyone had an aisle when we were playing. Everyone just like went in the middle, but Denny was across from me, and it was it got dark, and the bus was all quiet, and I'm sitting across, and I felt this like breeze start hitting me, a cold breeze, and I look, and Denny had the list of who owed who, and he threw it out the window, and I looked at him, and he's like, your name's on the top of that list. <laughs> I'm like, no worries. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, yeah, it was uh, crazy. And crazy I think price. at one point, Mitch won a bunch of money, or or Skip owed Mitch a bunch of money, and, and Mitch said, look, you don't have to pay me, but you throw the book away. Everyone's clean. Dude, I, yeah, I remember. And, uh, it, was, it was tens of thousands of dollars yeah, in it's, this book. It was, I was out of my league, for sure. I was just yeah, a oh, yeah. mechanic making 300 bucks a week, you know. And, you know, I remember going to Dean's house and I lived up in the valley and I would drive to Dean's house in my mini truck and dude, I would lose all my money, dude. And I didn't even have gas money to get home. I was like getting changed together. Like it was stupid, uh, but yeah, I, I bet you, I mean, I don't know, but I think that game cost uh, a lot of people their marriage that were married that play. It didn't help. Yeah. It didn't relationships. Help. I mean, their fights broke out. Um, a lot of th- crazy things happen at those games, so for sure. You uh, you spent a lot of time with Kerry Hart and RC um, on both of the teams when it was Hart and Huntington, and then went to RCH. What's your relationship like with those guys now? You still keep in touch with them? Uh, with you know, just pretty much cordial. I mean, before the split of RCH and the team folded, I mean, Kerry and I were on a day to day basis where we would talk pretty regularly. And, you know, I've known Kerry. I've been in contact or talked to him, you know, what was going on every day or at least two or three times a week for 20-something years. Hmm. And then when the team dissolved, the phone wasn't ringing, he wasn't ringing, and he was, you know, busy having a family and doing what he had to do. And I got butthurt over it. I was just like, yeah. And, the, you know, Ricky and I, you know, a lot of people don't know, but I was kind of that buffer between Ricky and Carrie that Carrie didn't even know Ricky. Mm. And I'm the one that, I mean, he knew him like cordial, like passing, but I, I'm kind of the one that connected the dots with those two. And Ricky came to me and said, hey, I want to, you know, you know, be part of a team. And I thought he wanted to hire me, like my ego so big. And I was just back then. And I'm like, dude, I'm, and he's like, no, idiot. I want to like join forces with, with Hart and Huntington. You guys have the most successful privateer team, I think. And, you know, I could bring Suzuki and blah, blah, blah. So I asked Carrie if you'd, if you know, interested because before we were talking about, we only did Supercross and, you know, we were raising a lot of money for a Supercross only program with Don Elite Rider. And, it was like Kerry before Ricky came, we were talking about just downsizing, doing just like a, you know, show hauler type of deal and do like one or two guys out of that and do supercross and, you know, take that money and, you know, split it up and go do something else. And then Ricky came on and a lot changed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So that was the deal, but I'm still, 
RC and I, you know, we talk, you know, he'll check in, shoot me a message. This is quirky. You got to know Ricky. He'll yeah. send me some stupid text of someone doing something retarded, you know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, those guys are definitely part of my uh, life and career. I mean, they're both, put it this way, if I was in a jam, something seriously was happening, I know I could call either one of those guys and they would be there. Yeah, all right, good. Um, listen, get over to Whiskey Throttle Media if you guys uh, have not yet. Check out some of the content we've got going on there. All kinds of stuff, including a new podcast. Oh, really? From yourself. Inside the Rut. Inside the Rut is back. Yeah, I mean, uh, to tell you the truth, when I did it myself, it was uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and I, w- I was getting you know burned out on it. I had my uh, partner help me do it at the time, and he was living at my house trying to do it, and it just I just got overwhelmed, and it was just like right after the split of RCH, and I was kind of like you know in a weird spot in my life. I didn't kind of you know thought I was gonna totally walk away from Moto and do something different, and then I'm like. I'm locked in. There ain't nothing else I can do. I've been doing this my whole life. You know, I got no choice. And uh, so little by little, I've just been doing little odds and ends. And, uh, you know, finally, uh, I met Greg, who's my um, co-host. And we started hanging out. And he asked me about the podcast. Why don't I do it anymore? And I'm just like, I'm not irrelevant anymore. Like, people don't know. And he's like, dude, you are you are relevant. He goes, you got stories, you've been around, you know a lot of people. And I'm like, yeah. And uh, I just said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do a little you know, teaser out there, see if people, and I'll ask some people that I know if it, they think it's worth it. And everyone I said, they said, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I said, screw it. I said, you want to be the co-host? And he's a super fan of super fans. I mean, mm-hmm. this guy could tell you what, you know, gear setup Jeremy McGrath had on in 95 at, you know, Orlando. You know what I mean? He's up on everything moto. He loves motocross. Like, that's his... Some people love football. He loves moto. He probably has... He probably spent over a few hundred thousand dollars at Fox. <laughs> like, that dude will get any new drop, a boots, helmet, gloves. He loves it. The guy just loves the sport, and uh, you know, I figured, shit, if I'm going to do this, I should get a guy like that because I need that fire brought back into me. Someone yeah. that's just amped and excited um, to be part of something. And uh, well, that's a cool perspective, though, because most people have, if you're doing a podcast, the host and co-host are both industry people, right? And yeah. a lot of times we get too close to it, yeah, because we we've been involved for so long, and our perspective's kind of skewed, and totally. Um, where he is like this naive Dude. little little boy. <laughs> he Dude, just, he is. But he just has a pure awe. love for it. Yeah. Yeah, he's in awe. Like he came over here the other day and he was just like, we left and he called me. He's like, Dude, I was at David Pingree's house, bro. Like I seen all this. He goes, Dude, this is unbelievable, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> like I'm like, Dude, That's like funny. I we we take it for granted. Yeah. You know what I mean? We really, really take it for granted. It's like if, uh, you know, I went to Mike Trout's house, I'd be the same way. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, you know, it's just something that I've done forever, and I just don't well, really realize when you're it. When you're as involved as you and I have been for so long, yeah, you see all the warts and the kind of the underbelly and the, the things about it you don't like, mm-hmm. right? And then it taints it for you. And you're like, it's still cool. It's still the coolest sport, in my opinion. Totally. There is, but... You don't look at it like he does anymore, yeah, right? No. Yeah, so no, yeah, I, no. I think it's cool. I think you guys will be a fun team, and yeah, um, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. He's a he's a really good guy too. I mean, he comes from you know, you know, hardworking family. You know, his dad was a truck driver. He's a truck driver. Yeah. He drives hazardous waste. Yeah. So he's uh, you know, his mom's like in a manager for an apartment building, I think, and. You know, he was, he's just a great guy, and I'm just blessed that I could have someone like that jump in and, and fire me up. Yeah. You know, so. That's cool. Well, I'm looking forward to it, man. It's yeah, if cool. you don't subscribe to our podcast channel, uh, do it, and then you'll get notified anytime, obviously, yeah, one of our sure. podcasts drop or one of Kenny's, so uh, it'll be cool. Check it out. Uh, we got lots of stuff over there, too, merch, uh, a forum, all kinds of stuff, so uh, check it out. Our guest is brought to you today by Yamaha. Um, let's get into your story, man. Tell me where you grew up. Wow. Um, 
Where were you born? I was born in Santa Monica. Okay. This, uh, you know, David, this, uh, I've always really never told my whole story to anybody except for a couple of really close friends um, and my therapist. Um, I was not brought up the the normal kid, the normal family. I was always thought that I was robbed of my childhood. Um, my dad and mom are from New York City, and my dad is or was uh, a full-blown heroin addict. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, my dad got in a lot of trouble in New York City when he was, you know, 18 or 19, and he was getting ready to go to jail for quite a while and they gave him the opportunity to go move to California to a rehabilitation place where you had to live and join and my dad decided he wanted to do that instead of going to jail so saying that my mom at the time was pregnant with me and she was like 16 15 16 around there and her parents wanted her to get an abortion so saying that, my mom and my dad and my, my dad's mom, my grandma on my dad's side, funded my mom to go, and she ran away, and she moved into this facility that took normal people in, too, and the place was called Synanon. And what it was, it, was, it started out as one of the first rehabilitation centers for drug addicts, and uh, the place just... Uh, you know, I was born there, and after I was born, I was... Oh, part- you were born in the in that facility? I was born in the hospital, but when I went back, they took me to the facility. Okay. So saying that, you know, let's say there was another family that had a kid about the same time as me. At about six or eight months old, I was taken away from my parents and given to another family. And the family that I was given to, their kid went with my parents. Okay. So... That happened, and I was passed around for years, for years. So you'd go from family to family? Yes. The place probably had, I mean, it started growing and getting bigger, and it turned from a rehab into like a huge, um, they got a tax exemption from the government. So what they started doing was getting a bunch of money from these huge companies, and they would do like a kickback. If you give me, you know, five million dollars i'll give you back 2.5 to pay your taxes with and they started getting super shady and just a bunch of things happened um if you get a chance to look it up it's called sending on um the place pretty much turned into a cult it was a full-blown cult so you you just said hey look this stuff up and i did some research on it yeah it's uh from I think fifty eight or something is when it started. Well, that's when it like the founder, pretty much the guy's name was Chuck Dietrich, started it with like two or three people. He was elderly; he was probably in his fifties around then, and he started it. Um, and it grew from a little apartment to a storefront, from a storefront to a huge facility that's still in Santa Monica, still in Santa Monica. And the crazy thing is. You said it's a brick building just south of the pier, yeah? Yes, it's a red. It's on the corner of Pico and Ocean Park, if anyone's familiar with that area. Um, and it's a super high-end hotel right now. But I was in Santa Monica with a friend, um, Melissa, and I said, hey, uh, let's go out to dinner. This place is supposed to be really good, this restaurant. And we were staying up the road, and we walked there. Or no, we drove there. And I really wasn't paying attention, and it ended up being that building, inside mm-hmm. that building. And I walked in, and I was just mesmerized. Like, I had chills going through my body, because in this place, a lot of bad things happened to me. Like, I really don't like to talk about it. It really f- fucks me up. But... uh I went there, and there was this one s- s- place in the building that really a lot of things happen and i remember walking past it and i like almost broke down like i couldn't comprehend that what was i doing here why am i here again like what's going on and i had to tell the girl like hey hold on i'm gonna go to the bathroom real quick and i just had to get my 
pull myself together and we sat down and she's like, are you okay? And I had explained to her a little bit what was going on. And uh, she was just like, I don't think she really got it, but she was just like, wow, that's crazy, blah, blah, blah. And I had to explain to her this building right here. I spent the first 12 years of my life here. And I knew every nook and cranny in that building. And uh, it was just crazy to be there, you know. And it, it ended bad. The whole place ended bad. And what happened with me was um, there was a lot of physical violence. There was a lot of um, sexual molesting going on with me. Um, I was just around um, really... Adults really weren't around that often. So the kids would, you know, we were with kids from the age of 16, 17, all the way to two or three years old. So the older kids, you know, would have their way with some of us. And we didn't know any better. And uh, so what happened was I went away to New York City to visit my grandparents one summer. And... When you're in this place, Synanon, you're not allowed to cuss. You're not allowed to fight. You're not allowed everything to your elders. You had to say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am to everybody. You can't call your, your real parents who you see once a month on a Sunday. Um, mom or dad, you got to call them by their names. Um, and I went to New York to visit my grandma. And I seen what it was like to be a kid. Mm -hmm. and I was like blown away um, that there was a, 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 another way of life because I didn't know. That's all you better. knew. I didn't. Right. Yeah. I was, you know, like a dog. I was trained that way and I didn't know any better. So I got back and I got all the kids was, I was with the kids and I'm like, dude, there's so much different. Like the kids, like we look different because we had shaved heads and we wore overalls. We also look different. I and mean, we're talking the era of Leith Garrett and, you know, Z-Boys and all that crap. And we look and we were like literally like a block away from where the Z-Boy store was. Like it was the Z-Boy store here, a street, and then our building and then the ocean. Like, so we were always, you know, getting picked on and called names by those people. And so what they did was... They took me in for an example, and that's when they started this thing called the Punk Squad, where they took all the troubled kids that were causing problems, and they took them up north. And the way they took me up there was in the middle of the night, they came and woke me up and put me in a van, like an 18-passenger van with a bunch of kids. And we drove up north. I remember like just driving, and it just seemed like forever and it went to um, a place called Walnut Creek, Tamales Bay. And uh, we lived in like an army barracks and there was just things that happened in there from violence, molesting people, just uh, like they treated you like you were in the army. Pretty much, you'd have to get up and run, and if you didn't run, there was a dude behind you with steel-toed boots just punning you in the ass, kicking you. If you laid on the ground, they would just start kicking you in the ribs, just get up, calling you names. And, you know, my parents didn't know what really was going on. Um, and they would literally stand over you, and my mom still has this, how much I love it here and hit me over the knuckles with like a wood ruler if I didn't write the right thing. And well, have you, had you. To, you had to write letters saying you were loving it there. Yeah, this is the best place. I'm up here. I'm learning how to do stuff. And the funny thing is, is I never went to school when I was in this place. And they would sell it to people to come in, you know, that they had a great school system. And, that, you know, just the people, because when people came in to send it on, you didn't have to be a drug addict anymore. It was just if you wanted to come and change your life and be, you know, it was like a commune. Yeah. So people were coming in and with their families and saying this, this schooling was great. There was no schooling. You sit there and color, you know. <laughs> and I did that all the way until, you know, I was old enough to be like in third grade when we left. 
So I didn't know how to read or write. And what happened was my parents found out what was really going on. And if people want to check it out, if you go back and look, um, there was a show back in the late, in the early 80s, I believe, and it was called Scared Straight. And it was about kids that went to, they were like in juvenile hall or something like that, and they took him inside of a, a federal prison, and they had inmates in their face screaming at him and taking their shoes away from him and saying, what are you going to do? You ain't going to do shit. These are mine now. Like, just crazy shit. And they got that format off of what we were doing. So my parents found out, and there was, like, literally armed guards around this place. Um, it was on, a like, I want to say a couple hundred acres, and they had their own, they call it uh, something Marines, where they had, you know, a few hundred people that were, like, armed and, you know, ready to go to battle. And you couldn't, you know, get into this place. There was It was gated, and you had to go through a checkpoint to get through. Well, my dad ended up knowing someone, a couple of the armed the guards, and they were his buddy, and he got through. And he came in, I'll never forget, in the middle of the night, someone started shaking me, and I woke up, and it was my dad, and he goes, we're at, we're leaving. And he said, let's go. And I'm like, don't leave me here. Don't leave me here. They beat me up and blah, blah, blah. And some other kids woke up and they're all, take me, take me, Bill, take me. And my dad's just like, no. And he's running out with me. I'll never forget it. And he's running out. And we get outside and there's like a big U-Haul truck. And it was one of those, just like a bench seat. And my mom was sitting in the truck, ducked down. And my mom's like four foot 11. And she was ducked down, and I was I got in the truck, and my mom seen me, and she just grabbed me and started hugging me. My dad just pinned it out of there, and we never looked back. Mm. And uh, my grandma helped my mom and dad get set up where my dad, we ended up moving to Culver City. And uh, I remember I enrolled in school, and I went to school for the first time when I was in third grade. And uh, I showed up with a shaved head with overalls on. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I was didn't fit in, didn't feel comfortable. I was getting made fun of. But the thing was, I always excelled in sports. So if we were, they were picking teams for, you know, kickball, basketball, anything to do with sports, I always got picked at the front. And that's how I got accepted. And people started, I started making friends that way. And, uh, my mom and dad only stayed together like in the six months before my dad started using heroin again. Oh, really? Yeah. And started cheating on my mom. And my mom was the same way. She never graduated high school. She didn't have a driver's license. And she's all alone with this little boy and not a pot to piss in, no education. And my mom just looked at me and says, we're going to do this. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, I'm going to work and I'm going to go to school at night. And she got her, ended up getting a driver's license, learned how to drive. She ended up going to school, um, graduating from high school, going, taking some courses, got involved in the medical industry. And my mom just retired probably like four or five years ago as assistant, um, what's that called? Assistant administrator for Kaiser. Oh, really? Yeah. She, done, she did very, very, very well for herself. Um, that's so awesome. My mom is, you know, my hero. She, that woman played mom and dad. My dad was periodically popping in, popping out. Um, you know, of course, when I got in my teenage years, I started to get a little squirrely and my mom couldn't, you know, I wasn't listening to my mom. So my dad would just come around to punish me and beat me and tell me to listen to my mom. And he would show up all loaded on drugs and try to get to my mom. If my mom, you know, had a guy over or was dating someone, he would always fight them and go to jail. And I seen all this crap at a young age. Um, so, uh, you know, my mom ended up moving to the San Fernando Valley, um, and she bought a house. Well, my her parent, my grandma bought a house for me and her, and she still lives there to this day. And uh, She's retired and she's doing great. Um, you stay in touch with her, pretty close yeah. to your mom. Yeah. And my dad, um, I've had a really hard time with my dad because 
he was never really that father figure to me. He was, you know, on drugs a lot of the time. And then we would go out to dinner and hang out, and he would tell me, sit in on rules, call me Bill, you're not my son tonight, I want to get this waitress's phone number. And it was never said, hey, I'm proud of you for what you did. You know, I played baseball growing up, and my dad would show up at games fucking wasted. Did you and- know when he was high or not like you you understood what was going on i mean anybody would know he would just show up and be obnoxious as hell and it was you know i played baseball you know little league baseball and all that stuff all the way through you know until probably i was like 18 and uh, he probably seen two or three games he got kicked out of the league he couldn't show up um you know, one one time I remember he showed up and I was warming up and it was, I was playing catch with him and there was me and another guy and my dad was on the other end because my dad played baseball. He was really good too, but drugs jacked him up and we were warming up and I would throw it to my dad and my dad would throw it back to the other kid and then the kid would throw it to my dad and then he would throw it to me. Well, I threw it to my dad and my dad was supposed to throw it to the other kid and these girls were walking by, and I looked over at the girls, and he threw the ball, and it just smacked me right in the face with a baseball. Just, like, freaking nailed me. My teeth went through my lip, and I just went down, and I'm like, I, didn't, I wasn't even crying. I was just like, why would you do that? He's like, I taught you to never take your fucking eye off the ball. And I was just like, whatever. And the coach got all pissed, told him to leave. They wanted to take me to the hospital, put stitches, and my dad said, we'll go after the game. You know, just Jeez. shit like that. And, you know, <clears throat> I had an addiction issue go down with myself. And, you know, I got addicted to um, pain pills. And my dad told me... Why In high school we... or when was this? No, no, no. Oh. This was after. This was, you know, 2000. When I was kind of working at Plano. And I just reached out and said, hey, I got an issue here. I can't, you know, control this. And I needed help. And... You know, my dad was in recovery, out of recovery, and he kind of knew, you know, what to do. And my mom reached out to him, and he called me, and he started calling me a pussy. He says, why are you wasting your time taking pills when you can just shoot heroin? (laughs) Fatherly advice. Are you fucking serious right now, dude? But God rest his soul, he just died about four days ago. Um, And... I haven't really, I hadn't talked to him for probably four years. And uh, when he got sick, he was in the hospital, and my family started calling me. His sisters called me just to tell me what was going on. All of a sudden, like, I was talking to my counselor and my therapist, and I, I just, I, I was numb. Like, it didn't bother me at first. And I was just like, eh, whatever, you know, it sucks. Because I always told him, you're going to die alone because you're a piece of shit. You don't, you know, you only think about yourself and you were like that your whole life. You're going to die alone and your old man. And he did. Mm -hmm. But when he was first diagnosed to go into the hospital, I was like, fuck, I can't do that. I can't be like that. I'm better than that. I'm stronger than that. I have to go down there and see him. Well, they kind of put him in an isolation. Um, And they had a breathing tube down his throat, and he couldn't breathe without it because his lungs were all screwed up from smoking and breathing asbestos and whatever. And uh, they were getting ready to transport him to, uh, like, it's not hospice. It was like an assistant living place type of and they were getting ready to uh, transport him, and they wanted to put a trach in to try to help him build up his... So before that, he was kind of in and out, and I told the nurse to put the phone up next to his ear. And I had to make peace with him, at least try, and I I called him, and uh, I just told him I loved him. And it was, it, was, it was fucking hard, and I just told him that he had a son that needs him and a granddaughter that, you know, needs him. I mean... My daughter's 10 years old, and he's he's only been around her twice, mm. you know, and it, it, that fucked me up. And I was just like, she's a beautiful 
human being and I'm not going to let my dad fuck her up like he did me and I have to protect her. Yeah. And that was so fucking hard for me to do, man. And uh, I wanted to go see him and tell him in person that I that I fucking loved him and you're my dad and you're the, you know, you're my only dad and I have to deal with that and I'm okay. I want to move forward and I want you to be part of my daughter's life and I want you to be part of my life and I need you to get better and be strong. And the nurse said, he's opening his eyes and he's shaking his head. And I was like, fuck, wow. So then I said, I have to go see him. And I wanted to go down there and see him and I was going to go and they called me the next day and told me he died. Hmm. So is what it is. Well, that's heavy, man. It, that's, um, it's got to be tough for you knowing that he, he failed you in so many ways as yeah. a dad, but he's still your dad. Yeah. So that's a hard... I, I can't even imagine being in, those, in that position. Yeah. And, so it's something I got to deal with, and it's tough, but, you know, and it's really hard, you know, the first 12 years of my life, I felt like I was robbed, you know, of my childhood, but... When you were, when you, were you know, old enough to really be aware, 5 to 12... Did you realize, I mean, you said when you went to New York, you kind of got a, a peek at like, oh, this is what real life is like. So from that point forward, we like, man, I, this is screwed up where I'm at. Yeah. This isn't normal. I'm getting abused. I'm, you know. Yeah, well, I was at the, as soon as I figured it out and started to tell other people, they shipped me out of there. Oh, up to the. Uh, yeah, up to Tomorrow Bay. They shipped me out of there because they knew that I was a problem mm. and I was you know, telling all the other kids that this isn't right. And I knew it wasn't right. And I remember reaching out to my grandma and telling my grandma, cause she was kind of like our rock. Hmm. And I told my grandma, you know, this, what's going on. And she said, listen, mister, these are the cards you were dealt in life. So you could sit there and whimper about it and cry about it. Or you could just fucking pull up your bootstraps and deal with it. Uh, that's what I've done, and I've kind of put it, you know, it's crazy because I know a lot of people in this industry for a long time, and I've always hid behind this, like, I never told anybody what, where, where I was from or what I, you know, did and how I got involved in this whole industry, and and uh, I've always been scared that if I told people what I re who I really was, that you know, just like being a kid again, that I would get made fun of mm -hmm. and I would get picked on and people would talk shit on me on the, in the, you know, chat rooms and people wouldn't like me because of this. And then I'm just like, you know, in the last month, I'm just like, I can't hide this anymore. I have to talk about it. I have to get it out because it's affecting me to the point where my daughter's getting older and I see myself falling into some of those holes that I did when I was her age. And I don't want her to, to deal with that crap. Mm. I, I want to be, you know, a, a good dad. And the thing is, I don't know how to be a good dad. I never had that role model. I never had a dad and uh, I'm blessed. I'm so fucking blessed that she has a stepdad that is an amazing fucking dude. And she calls him dad. And at first it used to bug the fuck out of me, but I'm blessed and I have no problem with her calling him dad. And I remember picking her up from school one day and I always told her she was special. I said, Brecken, you are so special to me. And I picked her up one day and she's like, dad, I figured out today. I, I was talking to my friends at school and I know why you always say I'm special. And I'm all, why are you special? She goes, cause I got two dads, man. Uh, that just fucking tugged on my heartstrings so bad. And, uh, yeah. So I'm just grateful to have Jared in my life and for him to step up and help raise Brecken um, and, you know, Taylor's her mom. And uh, we've been through a lot to get to this point. And at first, Jared didn't want nothing to do with me. And 
they stayed away from me. And what I did was I just drove down to his house in San Diego and knocked on the door and introduced myself. And I said, listen, I'm not here to cause any problems. I'm here to make sure that you're good to my daughter and you're, you know, and good to Taylor and we'll never have a problem. And he's been awesome. And today I can call him one of my true friends. That's crazy. That's not like a, that's not how it usually goes down. No, <laughs> no. That's good though. It's great. I mean, it's funny. Like when we all go out to dinner and, you know, I was in a relationship for a few years a while back and we would all go to dinner and, uh, people would go what's going on here what's the connection here well that's my daughter and um that's her stepdad and that's her mom and that's her little brother and that's his son and this is my girlfriend and it was just ah but you know what it's all working it all worked itself out um jared is um he works in the elevators union he has great benefits he's a great provider for his family and, uh, you know, I'm just grateful that I'm in their lives and they let me be part of their life, you know, and part of that family. It's interesting to hear you talk about being a dad and like not knowing what to do. Cause it's like, I had a great dad and I still struggle with my girls. Like, I don't know. What to do. There's no manual. Yeah. Raising kids is freaking hard, dude. And mine were pretty, I wouldn't say easy, but pretty good through their, until they hit the teenage years. And now it's like, we've been... It's not easy, you yeah. know what I mean. And so, like, I've reached I, out. To I hear, I, not that I under, not that I understand your specific circumstances, but it's like when you're going, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be a good dad. It's like I get it. I mean, yeah. even with a good role model, my yeah. dad's not out here. You know what I mean? So, like, it's, it's crazy it's because, like, I've reached out to a lot of my friends that have kids, and and they say I'll say the same thing. There's no handbook. No. Just be a good dude, and if you say you're going to do something, you do it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I remember one time, it only took that one time that I told my daughter that I would be there to pick her up at a certain time. And uh, it goes back to when I was a kid, and I just started riding dirt bikes, and my dad rode. He's the one that got me into it. And he said, hey, um, we're going to leave to go riding, have everything loaded, and we're going to leave at 5 in the morning. said, no problem. I woke up, I went down, to, the, and he went out the night before, and he never came home. So I'm just sitting in the garage on the toolbox. It was back in the day when you had the mill crate with the oil and the chain <laughs> lube and all that shit. I'm just sitting there, and the clock's just going around. Every car that went by, I was, like, looking out the window, you know, and finally I fall asleep and I'm laying, you know, on the floor in the living room sleeping and he walks in and he kicks me right in the ribs and he said, go in the fucking, go in your fucking room. This isn't a vagabond hotel. You just don't fucking lay around the house. And he had some chick with him. And I, you know, so from that day on, I said, I'm never going to be like that. But that time I was told my daughter I'd be there to pick her up and I was a little late. I pulled up and I look over and I seen her look out the window. Whew. That was it. I fucking lost my marbles. And I said, I am him. I am turning out to be just like him. I can't do that. I can't be like that. And uh, I just went in and I apologized to her and I said I was sorry that I was late and I don't want... You know, I don't want to, you know, be late again. And I, I just want you to know I'm going to be here for you no matter what. No matter what, anything you need, you can talk to me. You can tell me. And, you know, I don't want to be your best friend. I want to be your dad. Mm -hmm. And I love you. I, I think, you know, you said you don't have a good role model as a dad. And I get that. I think you learn as much about um, the dad you don't want to be. Um, totally. Because my dad's bad habits... I mean, he's a drinker and a smoker and, you know, he had his issues and I, from a very young age, I don't drink, I don't, don't smoke, never have. And it's because I watched him went, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. It's exactly, you know, that's funny you say that because I was the same way with my dad. And like when I had the addiction problem, I always said to myself, I'm not like my dad though. I don't shoot heroin in my 
veins. I'm not smoking crack like him. I don't do this like him. You know, I'm the same way. I was never a, a, a big drinker, uh, you know. But I just knew that my dad was all those things that I didn't want to be. And I just told myself I'd never be like that. But then when I went to recovery and I found out about it, I was that. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, talking to counselors and getting therapy and find out just because I wasn't sticking, sticking a needle in my arm doesn't mean I'm not a drug addict. Mm -hmm. You know, I still have those same tendencies that he has and the same, you know, qualities as an addict. And I had to, you know, push through that and, and deal with that. Um, and that was a tough, a tough pill to swallow at that time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <sighs> Well, that's a heavy way to start the show, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you've been Sorry doing, if I... Uh, you've done a lot of... Drugged I mean, that out a little bit. It's uh, No, it's good to hear like it. Like I said, I, I, I just wanted to get that off my chest, and believe me, dude, I'm so... I feel like someone just took a fucking weight off my chest. Like, I just really wanted to... I didn't know I was going to go into detail like I just did, but you know what? No regrets. Yeah. It's, I think you got to, something like that. You got to talk about it, yeah. whether it's here or somewhere else. I think it's good yeah. for you to I mean, talk about it. Most people talk to their, their, their partner about it or their friends or family. They don't go on a podcast and talk to the world <laughs> about it. <laughs> but it's all good. Oh, man. And I just have to, the repercussions that are probably going to have to come my way from the great chat rooms, that's okay. Oh, well, those, those they are really they, You know, all I got to say is, you could say whatever you want, but you can't do nothing about it until you walked in my shoes. Yeah. Bottom line. That so I the, the research I did to that Synanon, you know, it started as a rehab facility, but it became a full blown cult. Mm -hmm. And um they they got so bad as to where they were there were they murdered and attempted to murder multiple oh, yeah. people. One of the guys that was investigating them, they put a rattlesnake in his mailbox and it almost killed him. They cut yeah, the he, rattler off. Yeah. And uh, it bit him and almost killed the guy. Well what happened with that was he was a lawyer, and he got hired by a guy that's wife that went into Synanon, and he wanted to follow yeah. up to find out what was going on with her, and they wouldn't give him any information about her or where she was at. Yeah. And then she was trying; she tried to leave at one time, and then they just took her, and they pretty much held her against her will up north. Yeah. Uh, so, and it went till the mid '90s or early '90s, yeah. and then it finally dissolved. And they're still but. supposedly cells with these people in there and if you talk bad about them or something you know there's they have like these reunions like every 10 years that people go to and like friends of my my parents my mom my dad whatever they know people and they're just saying you know this there's some crazy shit if you know people talk bad about it let you know there's there was huge embezzling going on oh yeah like there's a lot of people that were involved that are very very well off for that from dude that. in the 80s i want to say this guy was bringing in like 10 20 million a year yes in the 80s yeah because he was he was granted that nonprofit like that and he he was helping people so he would go to these huge companies and get shit donated at the time, they owned half of Santa Monica, that little square right there from Ocean Park all the way up to Overland. There was apartment buildings that people lived in that were in Synanon. There was gas stations they owned. You know, they would work on the general public's cars and the people would get gas and there was liquor stores, all kinds of crazy shit that they, they, they pretty much ran that town. It's crazy, man. Yeah. So, um, did you have any siblings? No. Only child. Never have. Thank God. And so your dad, you sent me a picture of your dad on, uh, what was the bike? It was kind of cool. I think looking. it was a Bull Taco Pursang. A Pursang, okay. Yeah. It's like a 70. So then did you have a little bike that he got you to ride? Yeah, or? I had a, uh, a Trail 70. Okay. XL, XL, Honda, it was yellow. Yeah. Yeah. With the step through, that like the little step through? No, runs? no, no. It was, it looked like maybe an XR75, but it had okay. headlight shit on it. Okay. Huh. But uh, yeah, he was the one that got me into introduce me to riding, and he thought he was like the coolest thing since sliced bread on a dirt bike. So, you did when you got out of there? Is that when you really got into baseball? Because you played mm -hmm. kind of you played baseball competitively, if I understand right. Yeah, I got out of there. Um, I started playing little league 
um, and I was at the that they didn't know how good I was, and they put me in fucking T ball, and I was just you know fucking crushing. hitting dingers. Yeah. So then, like after a few games, um, they put me you know in a, a division where I should have been, and you know. <laughs> They didn't have travel baseball back then. It was just like once a year you <coughs> sign up in February, you know, tryouts yeah. in April and blah, blah, blah. So I played baseball from there all the way through high school and on on into never made it to the college level, but I had the opportunity and I fucking pissed it away. Mm. So Did you struggle in school having, yes. I mean. I was always in special ed classes. Um, you know, the retard classes, like the people that would ride the, the short buses, I was in their class. <laughs> Those are like, your homies? Just... Yeah. I mean, the people that had like... Dance. I mean, by third grade, you've learned a lot of the fundamentals. So oh, yeah. you missed all of that, you know? Oh, dude, I mean, I uh, I was in that... Cl- like, you know, when you're in high school, you have like first period, you have over here, and second period, you go to here. I was in the same classroom all fucking day. Mm. I would get out for recess or lunch or you know nutrition whatever you call it and that was it and i'd go back to that same room and everyone would be walking by what you know in between classes and i'd just be chilling out in front hey it's me i'm in this this room classroom right here for the you know yeah for the you know underprivileged i guess and it was hard because like i was i thought i was like halfway normal i fucking i didn't have to wear a helmet to class like some people did and i was just like you know but once again i just feel like i didn't fit in i was i felt insecure about myself you know and trying to be something that i wasn't you know and you know that was just been a struggle for me a long time and you know we've had some conversations on this show phil lawrence was one of the guys we he and i had this conversation about uh Motocross racers, and, and this could go for any sport, but we just that's the sport we know, right? The guys who made it to really elite levels, they came from from good homes. Yeah. Right? McGrath, the Dungies, the Reeds, like their family. Good their family. families are still and that provides a sense of security, stability, yeah. which breeds confidence, that makes self-confidence. Sense. You yeah. had the opposite of that. Yep. You that had totally makes none of any of those things. Yep. And so it it bred like, you know. Yeah, it it's manifested like, it, exactly the way it should have, like, which sucks. Yeah, I, I think about it sometimes, like how different my life would have been if I had some kind of mentor that kept me on the straight line. And, you know, with my career in baseball, for instance, I mean, there's people that I grew up with that made it, that I was way better than. But anything could have happened, you know, and that's, that's fine, you know. But I always think back, like, I got fucking robbed, man. That's not fair. It's not fair, you know, I'm in the position I am, but you know what? God's blessed me with a great life. Um, I never thought in a million years that I would have a be blessed with a kid like I have. Like, that little girl is it's what it's all about for me. I ain't got nothing else, and she's it, you know, and... So that's where I'm at. You know, everything well, I do is for her. Do your does your grandma's words echo in your head sometimes? Oh, totally, totally. She, it's crazy because my my dad was the biggest mama's boy. His mom, like I would say, Dad did this, and she would go, she'd go tell me to fuck off, Mister. That's my son. <laughs> you know, and dude, she, she lived to be like 101, and she died like seven months ago. And I think my dad died of a broken heart, dude. I really did. Because mm. he called his mom every fucking day. Mm. Every day he called his mom. He was the biggest mama's boy I've ever met in my life. That's crazy. So what what screwed you up with baseball? Like why how did um, you just just bad decisions? I well, what happened was I had to go back to the thirteenth grade because of my just you know learning and when I went back, um, I wasn't eligible to play baseball anymore because I've already did it. So there was a scout team that I was playing for, and I got hurt. And when I got hurt, I didn't come back as soon as I should have came back and got back at it, and I just blew it off. Mm. I just said, ah, fuck it. I don't want to do it. I started hanging out with my friends in the neighborhood, riding BMX, you know, learned how to smoke pot and one thing led to the next. And then when baseball came around next time, 
um, my knee was, my legs, I just wasn't into it. And plus I had injuries and uh, I had opportunity to play on a, a team that I, if I did really good, I could have played at ASU, you know, and, you know, they were always hounding me, but I just, I just didn't do it. Mm. I just didn't do it. And uh, that was it. So how did you get introduced then to the world of moto? You were buddies with Kyle Lewis, right? Yeah, well, what happened there So how did you meet him? How did that happen? Um, there was a friend of mine. His name was Blake Schwartzman. And he owns this company still to this day called Plexus. I don't know if you know what it is. It's a cleaner. Oh, in a blue yeah, I've can seen and that. And you spray that, yeah. And he got a... Well, anyways... His Does he partner. want to sponsor a podcast? No. <laughs> this guy, dude, he's multi-millionaire, dude, and he freaking lives in a mansion in Vegas with no furniture. Like, oh. he's... Okay. He's a good guy. He's just a little different. But he had a partner named Jim Hartman who was the guy that started Utopia. Okay. Okay. But Jim came up with this idea called Swatch Guards. They were called Watch Guards, and there was a little rubber piece that you put over your watch. I remember those. Okay. So he came to my mom. Different colors. And yeah. You pop you, them on and off. He came to my mom and asked my mom if she wanted to partner up with him. for, And he needed ten grand for the molding and all this. My mom said, get the fuck out of here. You're crazy. Because he used to service our saltwater aquarium at my mom's house. Well, Blake got the opportunity to go in. And he did. And the thing blew up. Swatch. They did a. It was called a watch guard, and then they got inter, They got in with Swatch somehow. Then Swatch bought the, the rights to the name and Swatch Guard, and they would manufacture and make all the guards. Well, one thing led to the next. Swatch bought them out, and they got a lot of money. And um, Blake was totally into moto, mm. like big time, and he lived by <clears throat> me. Like I remember. He raced. He was like a local pro. And I remember, this is a funny story. I remember I was probably, I was a kid. I was still on a BMX bike and I rode by his house one day and he was out there working on his dirt bike. And there was this like super hot blonde lady, like blonde chick, like laying out. Remember those fold up beach chairs? Yeah. The little aluminum like ones. Nylon. Like, you, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you had a Volkswagen bug, you'd put it in the back, you know, the yeah. back thing. I remember driving, riding by, and I seen this chick, like, laying out, and, you know, I was just a little kid. I was like, whoa. And he, I rode by, and he yelled at me, come here, come here. And I ride up, and he's like, hey, Lisa, this is Kenny. He lives down the street. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? And he's like, hey, do you want to go to the races with us this weekend? Because he used to take me to the races with him. And I'd go flag or do whatever, Indian Dunes. Okay. And uh, I would be like, yeah, yeah. So, I remember he used to come to my school and pick me up when I was like in junior high in his truck with his dirt bike in the back. And I remember he had a, uh, a Nissan four-wheel drive with the Suzuki paint scheme. Remember the, the blues? Yeah. And it was a yellow truck and he had like the Suzuki stripe. And I thought I was so cool to pick me up and all the people would like look at I thought they even cared, but don't give a fuck. <laughs> so, I remember pulling up and he introduced me to Lisa and he goes, hey, see that baby right there? That's Josh. And I'm all, oh, hey, what's up, little kid? Josh Hansen. No way. Yep. Lisa is right when she left Donnie. Oh. And she started dating Blake. And Blake was with Lisa, and Lisa had Josh, and they were over there. That was the first time. So you met Josh Hansen. When Josh he- Hansen was an infant. He was in diapers, bro. That is hilarious. I didn't know that. Yeah. We, he jokes is, about it so, all the time. Do you still keep in touch with that Blake guy? Well, his mom dated Blake for a while, and they ended up breaking up or whatever. Um, yeah, so that's his real mom. I think she was like, she still is. I mean, I don't want to get into Josh's business, but I think it's, it's Lisa Petty, Preston Petty's daughter. What? Oh. Yeah, Preston Petty is Josh's grandpa. <laughs> okay. I'm learning all kinds of things. I had no idea. Yeah, I don't want to get... I mean, that's... That's his business, but yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know that. So anyways, Blake was involved with uh, the whole clique. Um, he knew Johnny O'Mara, because okay. Johnny was like a local good pro. He knew Jim Holly, 
and all those guys. And Johnny used to have basketball games at his house a few years later. And I remember I used to go over there, and I was kind of a somewhat athlete jock. And Wardy would be there, fucking David Bailey. All these dudes would be there playing basketball, and I was. Did just, you know who they were? Like, fuck yeah, I okay. knew who they were. I so, was a fucking fan, dude. Okay. I was like Greg, my co-host is. That's the way I was back then. Like, dude, moto was it for me. Okay. Like, I love motocross, and I would just go there and just be like, oh, and I'll never forget this. And I tell Johnny, is still to this day, I always do it. Osho, if you know Johnny, he is a fucking clean freak, like really bad. Yeah. OCD bad. And he would go, and he would go like this. He'd walk in his house. He'd take, take his shoes off, of course. And he would walk. He'd start walking, and he would go, get down on his hands and knees and go. On the carpet? Carpet. Get, stick it in his pocket. Like carpet <laughs> balls, like dirt. And uh, I just, I'll never forget that about Johnny. Like, that was him. But uh, Blake knew all them. Blake introduced me. I became, you know, so at friends about Johnny. I wasn't like. Hey, would go hang out. I was younger than him, but he would always, you know, say hi to me. If I went to the Nationals or something, I remember going to Saddleback at like fucking he's 85 maybe. And I've, Johnny O'Meara said hi to me. And I was like, oh, my God, in front of all these people. Like, I thought I was so cool because he knows me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And just crazy shit. But Blake ended up knowing Kyle. Okay. And... Kyle's dad just passed away and Blake was, you know, hanging out with Kyle and stuff like that. And, um, he introduced me to Kyle and me and Kyle just hit it off. Hmm. Um, and, uh, I remember Kyle, he took me with him. Didn't Kyle's dad die the night he won his first race? San Diego. Yeah. Kyle's uh, dad's last words to him was, don't forget the gas can in the fuel dump. Mm. It was a crazy story. I guess uh, he told me that his dad was having a heart attack and they had to call for a helicopter or something to get him out. And there was a, a car, a truck parked in the helipad. And Mike Craig went over there with his helmet, dude, and just broke out the windshield and fucking took the emergency brake off. And they pushed the truck out of the way. But... uh yeah, so Kyle. It, it so that was kind of your intro into moto with was yeah, Kyle. Yeah, and what happened with Kyle? Yeah, that was my intro. And Kyle was really good friends with Shane Trittler at the time. And um, 1990, Kyle was like full privateer, Kawasaki. He was riding Cowies, and he was going to Dallas Supercross, and Shane was going by himself and he just needed someone to help him. And I knew like nothing about working on a dirt bike, like zero, 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 zero. And I'm like, I don't know. He goes, dude, all you got to do is get his bike, push it to the line, hold it for him and then pit board him. Just put what place he's in or whatever. And I'm like, all right, yeah, cool. And I was working for my dad at the time. My dad had a construction company that was really successful and my dad's all, this is yours. When I'm done, retired, you're taking it. And I told my dad, I said, uh, I'm not, I'm taking some time off. I'm taking two weeks off. I'm going to Dallas to this motorcycle race. He's like, yeah, go for it. You know, he didn't care. I went to Dallas Supercross, first Supercross that I was ever. 1990. And I thought I was fucking that guy. I'm like, dude, I'm on the, I had my little AMA pass on the, in the plastic thing with the clip on it, hanging on my shoulder. I'm like, and I remember Shane gave me, I think it was like $60 to go get tires from Scott Swinehart. I don't know if you know that. Swinehart, used, I remember that name. He used to have the trailer, the Bridgestone truck. And I walk over there, and I just started talking to him, and he, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm Kenny. I'm, I'm working with Shane Trittler, um, blah, blah, blah. He goes, yeah, how's Shane doing? He's cool. You know, and uh, he, got, he sent me over here to, to get the tires everyone's using at this race. He said, yeah, it's an M22, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, cool. And he gives me the tires, and I go to hand him the money, and he goes, tell him not to worry about it. So I walk back, and I got these tires, and I'm like, hey. I used to call him boogers, because when he got off the track, dude, he just had snot running out of his face, boogers. 
And I'm all, hey, boogers, here. He didn't charge me for the tires. He's like, what? They charge everybody. I go, dude, he's my guy. He likes me. He's my friend. He's like, unbelievable. So then Kyle's like, how'd you pull that off? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And then uh, these swine started to tell like Shane, like, I like your mechanic. He's cool. So then going to San Jose, it was, you know, whatever it was, two, three weeks later, whatever it was, he goes, Shane's all, hey, do you want to go to San Jose with me? He goes, we're going to take my mom and dad's motor home and uh, pull the trailer. Um, you might know this, but you know Bob Moore's parents used to own... Protract. Protract trailers. Yeah. Well, Bob Moore and Shane were like this. Mm. And their families were super tight. Well, they had a Protract trailer done up, you know. And we put it behind the motorhome and we're driving. A lot of people don't know what Pro Track is. I like, know, that's crazy. They were the coolest trailer. I think they should come back here. They still are cool. They're kind of small, but... Did. For 80s and 65s and stuff like that? Yeah, they were cool. Yeah. But yeah. I remember uh, <clears throat> we were driving and... I don't know how I always end up with these fucking poop stories, but <laughs> we were driving and... Shane said, hey, we got to pull over. I got to drain the shitter. So we pull over and we're going through the grapevine and he pulls off and he goes, hey, you cool to drive? I've never driven anything like this in my life. I go, yeah, I'll give it a shot. He's like, just keep it between the lanes. You don't have to swap. I said, okay. So I'm driving the thing. We take off. We're going like uh, by Lake Pyramid over by Gorman and we're starting to go up this little grade and I see someone behind me flashing their lights and fucking honking and making all this commotion behind me. And Shane's out looking out the back window, laughing. I can hear him just laughing his ass off. And I'm all, what's up? And he can't even talk. He's laughing so hard. And he comes up front. He's like, I forgot to shut the shitter. The shit is flying out <laughs> on the cars behind us. <laughs> People were just so bummed. And I remember. Wait, yeah. I yeah. Mean. So I remember getting there with Shane. Kyle, you know, kind of parked near us. He stayed in the motorhome. And I remember going, I thought I was such a cool guy, I wanted to pull chicks. I said, I want to park next to the fence where all the people are walking by so we can pull chicks in. So it was a, we got there like on a Thursday night or whatever it was. So Friday morning there was just, you know, people there or whatever. So I pulled a couple chicks. One was super cute that Boogers ended up with. And I ended up with a girl that wasn't too small. She's a little <laughs> overweight. And you could ask Shane. Shane tells me, I hear this chick. Her and I start arguing, and Shane's like, what's up? He goes, last thing I heard from you was you said, hey, this bed ain't big enough for both of us, so if you're not going to be putting out, I suggest you go lay on the couch. <laughs> uh, true story. So... <laughs> I, I worked with Shane a little bit. I remember Bob Moore was riding in Europe, riding, uh, was he riding? A, yeah, he was riding Suzuki's that year. And I worked on Bob's, no, he's riding on KTM. Yeah, well, KTM. Oh. KTM. Yeah, KTM. And I remember I didn't know. He won his world title at a Yamaha, right? Yeah. Chesterfield Yamaha, right? It was a year after that, or two years after that. I remember somehow, I don't know. The bike was framed, and he asked Shane to ask his... He goes, hey, can you ask Kenny if he'll put my bike back together? And I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Well, it was one of the questions I had for you. How did you learn how to be a mechanic? Well, I'll get to that. But what happened was... I figured it out, and I got all the way to the foot pegs. I could not figure out how the springs worked on the foot pegs. <laughs> And Bob Moore came over, and I had to say, hey, check it out. This is what the deal is. I really don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I pulled it off this far, but I just can't figure out how to you put You got the it. motor in and all the suspension and everything? Yeah, cause there was a manual. Okay. But for some reason, I couldn't figure out how the fucking springs worked on the foot peg. Because what happened was I had them reversed. Oh. So I was putting the right one on the left. and then... So he showed me how to do that. And I pulled it off, and I didn't work on his bike ever again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so after that, um, I was like, you know, 
I want to do this. I want to be a mechanic. I want to go. This is something I wanted to do. And that's when I was looking up to, you know, the, the top guys. The mechanics are out there. Lunas and Tom Morgan and, you know, who else? Shane uh, Nally. And- yeah. Cliff White. You know, all the big right. dogs. But I didn't know shit, you know. And I didn't want to go to a trade school. So, um my friend Jason Eck, who owns the Racer's Edge, hmm. I don't know, I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I will. I used to take Shane's bike there in between the races and have him work on it because I didn't know what I was doing, like even a <laughs> top end, a bottom end. You tell Shane, we're all set, buddy. I dialed yep, it in. That's why you had Bob Moore <laughs> saying he wanted me to work on it. Uh, all right. And... I was such a kook. Like, I used to take that bike and drive it around in my truck around town like I was fucking cool. And I remember one time I was at TRE, and they just rebuilt it. And I don't know why. I can't remember. But I took it to a car wash, and it had all brand-new plastic and everything. And I was going to rinse it off because I rode it, and the tire got muddy or something when I was warming it up or something. I don't remember. And it went into a wheelie. And I was in second, and I shifted to third. And when I shifted to third, the thing just went, yeah, fucking. And I held on to it. It had brand new plastic, everything, and it just road rashed the shit out of me. And it was right in front of this bar called uh, Schnookies. And it was like a construction bar. All the construction workers went to work after because it was a topless beer bar Okay. in Simi Valley. And I just grinded myself like a pencil, dude, like a number two eraser. And I was like, ah. And the guys are like, you all right? I'm on. Yeah, I'm cool. I get the bike, put it back in the truck, I drive to TRE, and I walk in. They're all, holy shit, what happened? And I'm all, oh, I looped it. Fuck. And they're all, oh, my God. They're looking at it, and my arms was just road rash gravel. Dude, God is my witness. You could ask Jason Eck, wire brush and contact cleaner. Oh. To disinfect it. And uh, so I started to learn there. Well, the next year, there was a local kid named Randy Moody. I remember that name. Yeah. He was friends with Jeremy. That's how I met Jeremy. Okay. McGrath in 91. And him and Jeremy were like this. And he went and bought a peak bike. All blue, identical replica bike. But he had DG do all the mods. Hmm. So we call it the DG Peak Bike. It had DG pipe, everything. And he lived in uh, Ventura, Satakoy. And uh, I worked for him. And he did like the West Coast, Golden State, stuff like that. And uh, for me doing that, I met a lot of people. I met, you know, I, one time I wanted to be a Team Green guy. Um, but I just wasn't, there's no way I was qualified to do that at the time. Jose Gonzalez was the guy at Team Green. And he said, you know, we don't need any help, but I could put the word out to some of the riders. Maybe they need a guy. And they lined me up with Ray Crum. Hmm. So Ray Crum was really, really good friends with Scott Myers. Scott Myers, okay. Yeah, I remember all these names. So funny. Scott Myers' dad owned a place in Sacramento called Checkpoint Engineering. Okay. Ray lived in Sacramento, or Ray lived in Bakersfield. Checkpoint Engineering, where Meyer's dad had his shop, was in Sacramento. Not in Sacramento. It's right down the street from the track. Uh, I forgot Ran- the name. Uh, Rancho Cordova. Rancho Cordova, yeah. And uh, Ray told me, hey, why don't you take my bikes and stay up there and learn and work with these guys. And then on, you know, when we have to go to races, just come down here and we'll take the box van and we'll go to the races and do what we had to do. So what I did was I went to Checkpoint and uh, Dave, that's Scott's dad, Dave Myers, he said, I told him what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn how to, you know, build, you know, work on bikes. And, you know, I said, I'm, Working on the guy working with Ray is on the Cowie. I want to learn all about Cowies. And that was the year that they had those Kip power valves. Oh my God, dude. The Kawasaki integrated power valve system. Exactly. Dude, and I could never figure out how to put them back together. 
So dude, I would literally go through three or four cans of contact cleaner every time I did a top end on his bikes. I would never take them out and clean them. <laughs> just, just <laughs> contact cleaner them out. So I mean, the year before I worked on the Hondas and the power valves were just those, you know, and I was like, you know, those are simple. But for a year I lived up there with the Myers. Mm. And I became really good friends with Scott and Stephanie, his wife, still to this day. Um, and uh, they taught me a lot. There was a guy named Rainey that worked there at the time. Um, they came up with this thing back in the day called the turbo crank. And what it was, it was a crankshaft, and they drilled fins and holes through it where it built pressure and more air and uh, th- that would go through the crankshaft case, I mean, to, b- to build more horsepower. Hmm. So... I learned all about that, and I learned about splitting cases, and I learned about, you know, servicing bikes and all that. And uh, so at the end of 91, I was, you know, working with Ray, and we were going, like, Ray, he didn't put no work into it. He'll tell you so to this day. He did not train. He didn't work hard. He rode Supercross. That's when a lot of the Team Green guys, if you remember, you could ride amateur like they had a lot of guys that rode amateur stuff, but they would also ride supercross and, and uh, ultra cross. Yeah. So he did that. So we would go to a lot of races. Do you remember the one race where him and Tommy Clowers, they, I don't know if you know this, but they crashed together and he got up and he jumped on Clowers' bike and rode a lap on the wrong bike. I think I remember hearing about that, but where uh, was it? Do you remember? San Diego. And dude, he was like 6'2, Tommy's like 5'4. I mean, four or five. He's a little guy. Oh, yeah. And Ray said, dude, it had raised foot pegs. I didn't know what the hell happened, you know? And <laughs> I remembered the starting gate was right behind the section where they fell. And I went over there to, like, try to do something, even though I couldn't touch him. And I remember turning around, and all the four, all the 250 guys were on the line just laughing because he was riding the wrong bike. They all knew. And Bale, I remember Bale more than anything. He was just like trying to talk to me. I couldn't understand him. He was just, he was just pointing at him, laughing. But uh, at the end of that season, we were on our way to, I think, Florida for Minios. Minios. And I told Ray, like, I was taking this serious. Like, this is what I wanted to do. And I was putting in a lot of work. Like, I wasn't making much money. Um, they didn't pay me money at checkpoint because I didn't do anything for them. I was just there to learn to intern, and you know Ray would pay me like a hundred bucks a week. And I told him, I said, "Hey, like this is my livelihood here. You know what I mean? I don't have nothing else I'm banking on. I quit my dad. I quit that job. My dad thought I was fucking crazy. The main reason why I quit it is I couldn't hate. I hated working for him. Yeah." And just that whole deal that he was my boss and he would come and make examples out of me and yell at me and be that douchebag he was in front of people, you know. So I quit and he said, you're an idiot. This could all could be yours. And I said, I don't want it. I'm going to go do something I have fun with and that I want to do. What are they paying you? And I told him, he just said, I'll never understand you. So, but I told Ray, I said, Ray, you know, you got it train you got to do more stuff you know because he smoked pot he loves smoking pot and we're driving and we're ta- trying to give him that pep talk and he tells me he goes yep i'm done don't worry about it i'm done we're gonna fucking crush it you know blah 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 because he he was like good enough to get a ride you know he won a few titles back then you know he was a top you know he was top 10 supercross guy he's fast yeah like he had this box fan that had like a door behind the sleeper that swung open on springs. I'm driving, all of a sudden I fucking, it fucking smells like weed. And when I used to have this stick that I could po- poke open the door to check on shit in the back, and I'm all, it smells like fucking pot. And I thought Ray was sleeping, and he wasn't there. And I poked the thing, and he's standing on top of a stand blowing weed smoke out of the fucking vent. I said, dude, I'm done. Mm -hmm. After this, I'm done. Like, you're not taking this. I said, 
your mom fucking blames me for everything that I'm the shittiest mechanic that I do this, I do that. You don't get my back and you're the fucking problem. So I ended up quitting and I didn't know what I was going to do, but Ty Birdwell was really good friends with Scott Myers. And Ty's deal was his dad was a very successful car dealer up in Washington and Oregon. And Ty was, you know, a, he was intermediate then. And uh, he was turning pro, and he ended up breaking his back really bad after I started working for him. So he was pretty much done for the whole 92 season. So I really didn't do much in 92, but, you know, work with, he rode Suzuki's. His back got better. We did a lot of local stuff. And then in 93, we went and did... All the Supercross, not all of them, but he got hurt. He broke his leg or something like two or three races in. And his dad was so cool and wanted to help people that, do you remember Billy Joe Mercer? Yeah. Billy Joe was teaming up with Ty. and We were taking his bikes to the race. And his dad said, continue to take Billy to the races. I'll pay for everything. That's cool. So he paid for my hotels and, you know, all the fuel. So Billy just stayed with me. And he stayed on the road. So me and Mercer had a f great time. Mm. And uh, at the end of the year, uh, going into, that was 93, 94. At the end of that year, it was the same thing with Ty. I'm like, Ty, I take this serious. Like, I really want to do this. And I know you can do it if you started training. Because he got into smoking, too, and training, and so he was totally starting to work his ass off, and he was going up to Kyle's house up in the desert and started training with Kyle. And I remember it was a weekend, and it was a Friday night, and he got home, and I was going out on a date that night. And he said, dude, I'm riding tomorrow. Is it possible you could get my bike ready? It needs a top end. It needs a clutch. It needs a chain. It's just a bunch of shit. And I'm like, dude, yeah, you're putting in the work. I'll put the work in. I stayed up until God knows what time. I go to bed. In the morning, I was taking off to go somewhere. I took off. I came back about 2 in the afternoon, and I walk in, and I drive in his trucks in the driveway. I'm like, that's kind of weird. I walk in, feet on the – we were living at Jordan Burns' house yeah. in the valley. I lived there, and he just stayed there. And I walk in. There's a bong on the table. And his feet kicked up. And I said, what the fuck happened? You didn't go riding? He goes, nah, I woke up. I just didn't feel like it. And I just lost it. I said, dude, that's it, man. I'm done. Get your shit and go. Or fucking stay here. I don't care. You're my, you could stay here with Jordan. I don't care. And that's the next year is when I worked for Brian in 95 for the first time. Hmm. So who you were? Who were you working with in '94? Because that's kind of when I remember meeting you. Is when I'm on the road with Randy. Yeah, I worked for Ty Birdwell. It was Ty. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> don't you remember we went to the Bechtels with Ty? We went to the Bechtels. I remember, uh, <laughs> yeah, stuff in the hotel rooms like the Red Roof Inn in uh, Troy. I remember. Uh, I remember that uh, show. Uh, popcorn. You like popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. Tell that story. But yeah, but yeah, I remember yeah. the Red Roof Inn in Troy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was Ty. Okay. I couldn't remember who you were working for, yeah. so that makes sense. And we stayed at Adams, and we did that race at, like, the Delta or Delta something. Delta Raceway. And, it was like, you uh, killed it. You made a bunch yeah. of money. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. But after that year, I was just, I, could, I couldn't do it again. I was yeah. just like, no way. This is going nowhere. But believe me, I had a great job. I made good money. I had a brand new box truck. Anything I needed, I got. But it just still wasn't worth it. And then he had like a nice black box van. Huh? It was totally. I remember everything being sweet. And then uh, so how'd you get connected with Brian? You were living in you were living with Denny maybe or something. No, what happened there was Brian. Oh, I know. The year before, when Brian was still on Cowies, I met him at Loretta Lynn's. There was a guy named Jack Cox. Do you remember Jack Cox? No. He was one of the Richie Canyon guys. Okay. So I remember that scene. I met Brian. I met Dave Castillo. I met Jeremy, Joel, uh, Dino, 
all those dudes at Loretta's in 92 when I worked for Ray. Okay. And uh, I met Brian. Brian was, you know, part of their deal because he, oh, I know how. That year that Ty got hurt, I worked for Billy Feltz hmm. at Loretta's. And Billy and Brian, Brian used to live at Billy's house when he would come out here in the wintertime. Okay. So I met Brian, and from there on, like when we met, we just became friends. And then he, after, uh, I guess he was looking for a guy, Todd Brown worked for him. Oh, did he? I he worked for that. Brian that year. And then Todd Brown went to work for someone else, and he needed a mechanic, and he was riding on that Honda team with Swap. Atomic 22. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, that was it. I went to yeah. work for Brian, and I was supposed to live at his house and with him and his dad and his brother and his sister. And I stayed there one night, and I was like, I can't do this, dude. And I went to Denny, and I said, dude, I'll pay you rent. Just Why? Me. What was wrong with the Deegans? What? Um, looking back at it now, it was structure, and I never had structure in my life, and I just wasn't used to it. I just wasn't used to having that family figure, that family atmosphere. I was born alone. I never had, you know, it was just different to me. And I just, I just needed separation. Mm. You know, I worked. There, they had a shop in this like metal building. It rained. It sounded like the fucking bombs were getting dropped on you. And I just needed separation. So I just asked Danny, can I please? And he's like, you don't have to pay. You can just stay in the basement. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So I went and stayed at Denny's. And you know, from there on, it was we became friends. And I met that whole crew out there. And uh, <laughs> that's a whole other story right there. Those guys are good time. Which ones? The Omaha guys, Danny oh, yeah. and Bill and all those dudes. So, yeah, so that's I worked for him. And then uh, at the end of 95, you know, Brian did pretty good. He he had a lot of really good races, you know, as a privateer. And uh, it was between him and Sheik to get that Chaparral ride. Mm -hmm. And Brian told Larry, like, hey, I want to bring my mechanic Larry didn't want me. That was when I worked with Brian. That's when I had colored hair and just doing stupid shit, yeah. you know. But my bikes were always good. They didn't break. I just liked to have fun. Yeah. And I just saw that fun side of it, but didn't really know the corporate side of it yet. Hmm. So I was just having a good time. And then Brooks was like, no way. I'm not hiring him. If that's the deal breaker. And then Scott was telling me, oh, I might get this deal at Chaparral. And if you if we, if I get the ride, you could be my mechanic there. And I'm like, that ain't going to work. <laughs> they already booted me. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I guess Deegan's trying to get a ride there too. He goes, oh, really? He's like, so it's between me and him. And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay. I go, just let me know. Like two days later, she calls. Hey, you want to work for me? You want to be my mechanic? I said, yep. He goes, okay, I'll be there in about three days. He showed up. He was living with John Brash. I don't know if you know John Brash. Remember that name. He's what? a pro circuit guy, friends with Bitch. Okay. Down there in Corona. And he lived there, and uh, it all started. He, you know, that was the first year Suzuki had. Yeah, I was going to say, he was Suzuki support, right? Yeah, it was the first year Suzuki had a semi truck. So he got one of their old box trucks. And handed it over to me, and I really thought I was the shit then. I thought I was factory. Hmm. And uh, kind of was. I mean, bikes, parts, all that crap was paid for. He got expense money. Um, I'd lived on the road or at his, Scott's parents' house up in upstate New York in the summertime. Um, you know, and Scott did really well that year. Yeah. Considering he had a few injuries here and there, that kind of took him out championship contention in each series. But, uh, you know, he, he podiumed a few races, Supercross, and, you know, he podiumed a few outdoors. He had a couple, you know, win moto wins. That was 96? 96, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And then 97, he got a factory Honda ride, right? Yeah, I thought for sure that was it because I cleaned myself up in 97. Like, I'm like, dude, I got to play the part. Like, I didn't screw around. I My bikes were good. The truck was clean. Everything was on point every time. And even though it was two years later, he said, I want to bring my mechanic because there was a spot for me. And they said, nope, nope. The Japanese only remember that guy with the purple hair. Mm. And I'm like, fuck. Damn it. And they brought this guy over, Bobby, from the road race division that was a hack. Mm. Mike Hooker was just always on the bike. And uh, so I was back home, nothing to do. Didn't know what I was going to do. And my roommate was Jordan, Jordan Burns. And he was good friends with Eric Sandin, the drummer of No Effects. And they had this great idea that they were going to make a, a video like Krusty Demons. And they had the hand, the shoulder VCR camera. And they would go out and always video themselves riding. And they got a hold of this one guy, Kurt Haller, who made snowboard videos. And... Kurt came over, I'll never forget, they came over and they were all going to go riding and he, I, you know, inter they introduced him to me and they said, yeah, he's going to come out and film with us. And I said, what kind of expectations do you have to go film with these guys? He's like, well, I don't know, they're going to go jump and, you know, whatever. And I'm like, you know, they're not that good, right? Like, they're beginners. He's like, what? Yeah, I'm all, just let me know when you get back, I'll be here. And he goes, fucking waste of my time, dude. So, these guys, Kurt got involved and just made his mind up that he was going to put Moto Triple X into a production, like he was going to go for it. But those guys didn't. Only rider I think that Jordan knew was Damon Huffman because Jordan went to LACR all the time and Damon rode there. And he knew some of the riders because I lived there and they would come hang out like Brian, you know, and then J-Bone would stay there. Um, I'll never forget this. I think it was 90, yeah, it was 96. I was working for Sheik. Paggio just retired from racing. He had bad shoulders. Anthony was a good team green guy. Yeah. And he just retired and he was getting a job. I almost took the job that he got. It was working for Jimmy on the PJ1 PJ team one, yeah. when they started that. And... He shows up to my house. He's he stayed on my couch for like a month. He showed up at my house in a LeBaron convertible. Padge? Padge. Okay. With a Craftsman toolbox in the back seat with no shirt on. With one of those Troy Lee visor things. Remember those visor the things? The plastic visor, yeah. They look like a visor, but they were like a hat visor. And he gets out, he takes the seatbelt off, and he's fucking sunburned from the seatbelt. And he has the strap across him. <laughs> he's driving out from Florida? Yeah, he's no, he from did. Florida, yeah. <laughs> so, that, so that, that happened in 97. They just didn't really know many people, so I was kind of the, the middleman. And, like, between races... If it was super cross, like we'd be in Oklahoma, we'd go to Guy's house, Guy Cooper's house, and Swink and Mike Craig and those guys, Larry Ward, they were all there. So they would film those guys. And then like Daytona, because remember it used to go Gainesville, or it would go like Atlanta, Tampa, or Gainesville, Tampa, Daytona. We yeah. were there for like a month. Yeah. And uh, Kurt would come down, and we'd they would we would just get everybody together, and we'd go either go to Swink's house or Groom or whatever. It was just, uh, and that whole thing happened, you know. In '96, that's when all this was going on. Well, the video was done, and they started putting it for sale at the beginning of '97, and they started to sell it, and they I went to them and said, hey could be a great idea to, to do a team and use... Because Brian didn't have a ride. Brian Deegan. 
and he was pissed off. He thought he should have got that Suzuki ride over Ramsey. No. Oh. Huffman. Ryan oh, Huffman. Yeah. yeah. He was pissed. That's one reason why he rode Suzuki. He goes, I want to ride a Suzuki and kick his ass on a Suzuki. Mm-hmm. Dude, speaking of Ramsey, I'll tell you a quick story. It's probably 93. Okay. I'm at Mount Morris. They're early. Ty's box truck. Do you remember the Holiday Inn there where all the box trucks would park? Mm-hmm. And they would, they would work on their bikes and stuff, extension cord into the room, that old bullshit. Well, I remember me and Dino were going to lunch and we're pulling out and across the street was like a Motel 6 or a cheaper hotel. And I look and there's under a tree, dude, there's this dude fucking trying to spray paint this fucking frame, purple frame, in a driving windstorm and rain. And the dude's fucking purple. <laughs> like fucking purple. And we're fucking laughing. We go to lunch. We come back. I'm in my box truck. I hear this. Excuse me, sir. Do you got any scotch bride or uh, sandpaper? And I look around, dude, and it's Bundy. <laughs> I said, ah. Yeah. I said, no, let me look around. I said, who do you work for? He's like, ah, oh, I work for a boy named Nathan Ramsey from uh, Council Blood or Hickson, Dick- Tennessee. No, nope. It wasn't Hickson? Saudi Daisy. Saudi Daisy, Tennessee. All right. NASCAR country. I'm like, oh, wow. That's when I met Nathan and all those guys. And, and he was he, painting his frame purple? He was Johnny Yamaha. Okay. Back in the day. Well, to make a long story short, when I went to work for Sheik, Nathan was a privateer Suzuki rider the year before he got the factory ride. Yeah. And they were like struggling to get by. Mm. I think he rode for Checkpoint or no, he rode for CPE mm. uh, in Florida. Wynn and Bear Dog. R- <sighs> Rosini. Wasn't it RRP? No. It was the one Tishner rode for too when he came back from Japan. It was Wynn Kern and Bear Dog. Okay. They own that that shop. Well, he rode for them, and he was in his box truck with him, and they were just like, he would always come by, Bundy. He's like, dude, can I get your take off your plastic? And I was just getting tired of it. I'm like, hey, I just threw him the parts book. I said, order whatever the fuck you want, whatever you need. He ordered cases, a frame, swing arm, all the shit, because Scott got everything for free. Oh, you know, sure enough, the box came. It was theirs. Helped them, right? Mm-hmm. The next year, 97, I was working with Deegan, and Suzuki had this, factory Suzuki had a badass carburetor. Fucking, and it helped the bike tremendously. I used to run, like, you couldn't run a 38 because it would bog, so I ran a 36 and a half. You know, you bore out the yeah, yeah. Well, Suzuki had a 38 that was just a factory one that worked bitching. And I told Bundy, I said, Hey, they had that in an ignition. And I was in their truck in the factory at semi one time, and I seen like they had the, all the parts separated because he was the only factory rider, I think, that year for Supercross or something. But all the 125 parts, and I seen he had like four or five ignition boxes. And I'm all, hey, at the end of Supercross, let me, flow me one of those fucking box, those things. He's like, all right, I got you. And Supercross came and went, and we were getting ready for the outdoor. And I asked him, he goes, oh, I can't. I'll get in trouble. I can't give you that. And I just fucking lost it. I'm all, what do you mean you get in trouble? You don't think I could have gotten in trouble? You don't think I would have got fired for doing what I did for you? He's like, I'm sorry, man. I, I just can't. I was so pissed, like, Mm -hmm. okay, that's when I learned right there. Every man for himself. Mm. Every man for himself. So, uh, yeah, that was my Nate Dog story for Nathan. That's always been your way. Like, you're not afraid to ask somebody for help, but if they need help, you're always like... Always. Yeah. It's always, that's... I think that's the reason why I, 
been doing what I've done for so long. I've always had a helping hand, and yeah. I want to. I want to help people. Yeah. I just want to make you know th- people succeed, and I think that's kind of my downfall too. I'm more, you know, more worried about you know th- that other person. If it was my writer or you know a friend, I'm always not looking out for myself first. Yeah. You told me the other day, uh, and I don't even remember the race, but at Troy in '97, Dean and I were battling. And he hated me. I'm sure he was running his mouth about me nonstop back then. He ran his mouth about everyone, but <laughs> but you. But, yeah. but I got the pro circuit ride. I'm sure he wanted yeah, it. Yeah, he you was know, like he. Well, you know, it all stems back to the to the birthday party. I mean, the the poker game. It goes back farther than that. Brian and I almost got in a fight at Ponca City in '92. So there you go. It goes way back. The birthday party. Yeah, I don't even want to... I don't yeah, know we if we, you know, we share that story. It wasn't but, even a birthday party. It was just Shelly's birthday, and we were playing poker that night. Yeah. <laughs> you want to tell the story or no? I don't care. That's what we're here for, right? So I was dating Shelly Lawrence Shelley at the time, Lawrence, which was bad sister. form. I wish I could have not done that. Yeah, it was. they had a really crazy deal. So... Did you get the bed back? Uh, yeah. That was a big story. <laughs> the bed, dude. The bed. <laughs> We're not going to leave all. So at this, it was Shelly's birthday that night, and Metz and Deegan said, oh, we got you something. And she was genuinely excited. And they opened it up, and it was a, a picture out of, of me in motocross action. It was wrapped all in all a bunch of pictures of you, clips of every magazine, your poster, all kinds of stuff. And the present was wrapped up with that on the outside. And it was after they opened the box. It was one of them took a shit in the box, right? No, they shit on top of the paper and then put all the stuff around it. So when she opened it, she just put her hand right in it. And the funny thing I never understood is Randy and Phil were both there and they did nothing. That's one thing I never understood. Like, that's your sister. Like, yeah. And what were you gonna do? Yeah, I don't know. That's it, a nice. Picture. I remember that. That was a nice. I, I won that race. <laughs> I was looking at the pictures. Oh yeah, that's MXA uh, yeah. December issue. I just thought it was kind of shitty myself. No pun yeah. intended. Yeah. So going so, back to the triple X thing real quick before I forget. That video came out. It did really, really well. They ended up doing a team. I think we raised like $100,000 from sponsors, which was pretty good back then. Yeah. Um, and um, since we were already going, we said, shit, man, we might as well get a 250 guy. And Swink didn't have a deal. So we got Brian Swink. 97. Yeah. Okay. 97 was Swink and Deegan. And that's where it all started. Hmm. Yeah, and that movie, uh, obviously, Krusty and that one were... Yeah, you, you were in that. They filmed yeah. you out in Arizona, I think, at that yeah. old like airport or wrecking yard. It was called, or... yeah, Pinal County. It was yeah. down towards Tucson. Um, so that year, 97, though, we, we raced in uh, Troy, and I guess Brian and I battled. And I didn't even remember the, the race, but you're yeah, like, oh, hey, you guys were battling. Someone check it out. It was the 97-125 Troy race, and it was hotter than... It was probably the hottest race I've ever been to. Like people were dropping, yeah. like passing out on their bike, and it's crazy. I remember Fro lined up in all black gear. Like I think in. either ninety four or ninety five was really hot there too, because I remember I was parked next to Yogi, so it might have been ninety four, and he had a little play pool, and he would just fall into that thing after the motos. I remember thinking, God, that's smart. <laughs> Yogurt, him and Ed. Yeah. Um, but you said he was running a big board that whole day. And I'm like, God dang it. We ran a big board that whole outdoor season, I think. Not, not a works card from Suzuki, though. Dude, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I've said it a couple times, but it's probably one of the best stories I have. And it's still Brian to this day. He shows up at Unadilla and he goes... I got this new motor. I've been testing it at home. I want to run it this weekend. I said, okay. It was in a cooler, ice cooler, you know, chest. I unpack it, put it in the bike. I start the bike. The bike's just fucking vibrating. 
I'm like, what the fuck? Boom. I said, dude, the crank's out of balance. Something's wrong with this thing. He goes, let me see. He gets on it. He's revving it. He's like, it's fine. I said, okay. He goes out, first lap of practice. Comes around, goes to gravity cavity, and fucking just ejects. Does a complete somersault, lands flat on his back, bike cartwheels. I'm in the mechanics area around the tree turn back then. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. I go fucking running over there, dude. He's talking to the flagger. All of a sudden, he gets on the bike and he takes off, right, right, almost right when I got there. And I'm looking at the flaggers looking at me like he's seen a ghost. He's like, oh, what do he say? The flagger goes, who is that guy? I go, why? What did he say? He goes, that guy just said, that was baby shit. Wait till next lap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, That's funny. Yeah, that was good times. I remember we had that. Our bike, that we had a good running bike, and uh, so what? The big board just vibrated a lot, or what was the deal? Yeah, yeah. It was, dude, two pistons. The fucking thing was like a two fifty piston. It's huge. I remember it was yanking the factory guys. Like he was pulling starts, and they were all like, you know, pro circuit it was supposed to be a pro circuit motor, right? So they were doing in house Japan shit, and they they all they switched over to PC. Oh, really? To have them do their stuff. And I guess uh, they had a problem with the Nicosil peeling up that year. Okay. And Ferry corked one in practice. And whatever, they, they just switched that week at Millville, and they didn't have a spare. And I had to check the ring. You know, two rings. I had to check the rings because they get hung up on the exhaust ports sometimes. So I always had to check them in between motos or in between practice sessions or what. And I just was pulling the fucking jug off of it. And I hear, hey, hey. I turn around, dude, and it's Jimmy Perry. And he still worked at Pro Circuit then. And I had a towel that I had around my shoulder for sweat. And I just dropped it over the fucking, over the Pistol. cylinder. Yeah. Yeah. And I had the cylinder in my hand. I just turned it away. And he goes, hey, do you have a spare cylinder? And I'm all, yeah, I think the, the A cylinder, it's in the solvent tank. And he jumps up there and grabs it and just runs out. And I just looked. I'm like, oh, my God, that was close. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So, yeah, that 97 season, it was fun. It was a good time. And Brian did really well. And I'm surprised he didn't get a ride in 98. He rode for rode for Triple X again. But that season did not go well at all for mm. any of us. Mm. We rode Cowies. Cowies doesn't Bikes see, yeah. were terrible. Um, are we any good Swink stories? Sadly, we, you know, Sheik and Swink are both gone. Yeah, sad. With Brian, I think the funniest story that, I could ever... That dude was a character. Oh, dude. I didn't know. I could never, like, pin him down. He was just... He well, would do stuff and say stuff, and you're just like, wow. I don't know. I had a hard time pinning him down. I got to work for Brian. Uh, I want to say... 95 at the end when the woman that's who I was at Mexico with okay the Mexican races was he on Suzuki then still no Honda Troy a Honda Troy and uh we and the funny thing was I started a season working for Budman I mean the the Mexican series because hmm. I guess this guy couldn't go to the first round and something happened with Brian's mechanic and I was working for Budman because I worked for Budman, I worked for Sheik all in 96 until the last race. And I quit at the last race because his dad was such an asshole. And I could not stand his dad. And his dad just was, he, and he would just a typical thing. He would never stand up for me to his dad, you know. So his dad was going off on me and at Binghamton. And I just said, you know what, fuck you. I grabbed my toolbox, fucking took it over to the Great Western box truck and said hey uh, I need a ride home you know after next weekend well after the race Dean's all hey Budman needs a mechanic Bert can't Bert's gone or something happened Sheik and Budman were battling for the top privateer oh so all year I'm with Sheik trying to beat Budman now I'm <laughs> pit boarding Budman to beat the Sheik and I'm like how do I feel about this? Uh, and I'm like, you know what? Budman's my guy. Let's go. 
And uh, Bud Man ended up beating him. And Bud Man's all, hey, you want to go to Mexico? Do you want to go do the Mexican races? He goes, I, don't, I could t do the first one in San Antonio. And I go, yeah, let's just go see how it goes. So we go there. And it didn't go that great. He was winning the race, dude. It's like two laps to go. His fucking seat fell off. Mm. Was that your doing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I tried to tell him, bud, they were tight. And he's like, K-Dub, it's okay. If they were tight, the seat wouldn't have fallen off. And I'm like... Got me there. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> so... After that, I didn't work for Bud no more. Uh, I don't know what the reasoning why. I don't think he was going to all the races or something, but... Uh, Those Mexico races are wild. Yeah, and then Swink asked me to go, and I ended up going with Brian. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was crazy, that, that story with Brian. I was... We were in... What's that? Well, there was Monterey, and then there was... Uh, there was two in Monterey, and then two... Guadalajara. In Guadalajara, and, and there was one more. Guadalajara and... Well, that was Puerto Vallarta, or wherever you guys yeah, were, Yeah, right? Puerto Guadalajara and Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. And I want to say it was Puerto Vallarta. Um, we had like a few days off, and it was Button, Swink, Phil, and Dave Castillo. And... They're like, hey, let's go on this deal where you could, uh, you go snorkeling, you go horseback riding, and then you go into this canyon where there's a huge waterfall that you could dive off of and eat lunch. And uh, I'm like, okay. So we're all on this boat together, and we're the first people that they pick up, and they bring this little dinghy out. You get on the dinghy, and you take it onto the big boat. Well... They're going down all the way down the coastline, dude. And we're in this boat for like an hour and a half, dude. We're only While like they're picking other people up? Halfway, yeah. And Dave and Phil say, fuck this. They jumped, they jumped off the boat and fucking swam back to the beach. So it was me, Button, and Phil. No, me, Button, and Swinkster. So we get there. We go snorkeling. We do that. We go to this beach. It's like all secluded. We have... Tacos for lunch, you know, fish tacos. Then they bring these horses out for us to ride, and they look like they're ready for glue. Like <laughs> so they way are, back. And... They are just ribbed out, just funky, right? And, you know, I was a bigger guy. And, of course, they give me the one that looks like it can't even move. So and they said, all right, you know, senor, you go first. You go first. <laughs> just follow the trail. I said, Okay. So I follow the trail. The horse is like, just, like slow as yeah. shit. I'm just like, come on. I got Swinkster behind me going, come on. Fucking go. Ah. I'm just like, dude, I'm kicking the thing. It ain't going anywhere. I'm just like, fuck, whatever. So we get there, right? And there's these broads that were from Wisconsin. And they were both pretty cute. And they had like this deck where they had beers and people were doing shots. Well, one of the chicks is pretty wasted and you had to climb up the side of this rock and it was kind of like a go trail up it to get to the platform where you jumped off and there was one side where you could slide down the slime like a, it was like a water slide down a slime or you could jump off and the water was beautiful it was like super clear so you know we're sitting there on top and the chick's coming up and her girlfriend's like don't get down from there Get down from there. She's like, no, I want to do it. I want to do it. And Swing saw this chick's hammered. And I'm like, yeah, she's fucking wasted. And me, him, and Button are up there. And we're chilling. And the chick gets up there. And Jimmy starts talking to her about just sliding. Go to your left. Don't go to the right because there's an undercurrent, an undertow there. And she's like, okay, okay. And he's like, do you got it? Do you understand? And, dude, there's people all around. And she slides down, but she slides to the right. And she gets in this undertow. And the water is so clear, you can see her like a bobber, dude. She's just going up and down and panicking, dude. Swimming and, like, she's drowning. Yeah. And, like, all these Mexicans start screaming and yelling, but no one's helping her. She's fucking drowning. And I'm like, dude, I told those guys, I'm all, 
dude, we got to help her. Look at, he's like, shrieks all, fuck that. I don't know her. <laughs> like, I'm like, Brian, you serious? And Button's all, I'm like, fuck you guys. And I just dance all David Hassel off it. <laughs> Jumped off. I get to the bottom, dive underneath her, and I start grabbing her leg. Like, square biz. You could ask any of those guys. Well, just Button now. I get a hold of her, and I pull her out of it. And she pops up. I can see her popping up and splashing. But now I'm caught in it. And I'm like, fuck, just relax. Fucking little speed. So I'm underwater for, it felt like 15 minutes, but it was probably a minute and a half or something. It spits me up and I'm just like, the chick, when I come up, the chick's tops off. Then all the Mexican dudes jump in the water, right? And start grabbing her and fucking, hey, senorita, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, Everyone's like, you're a hero. And Springs all, you're a dumbass. You could have died. And I'm like, well, what are we going to do? Just let this chick drown in front of us, dude? He's like, it's like I said, you don't know her. I'm all, yeah, but that's not the way I am, Brian. Uh-huh. And he's just like going off on me. And I'm just like, you know what? Fuck this shit. I'm out of here. I'm going to go back to the boat. I get on the horse, dude. And I was so pissed. I just started kicking the fucking thing. Go, go. Ah. It made it about... 40 yards, dude, and just goes, kook, falls over, dude. My leg stuck under it. I get my leg out. The fucking thing's just sitting there, like, looking at me. I'm just like, fuck. So I just start walking, pissed off. Fuck this. I get back, and the one guy that was the captain of the boat, he's like, senor, where's the horse? I go, fucking back there. I just stopped moving. It just fell over. He's like, no, did you ride too hard? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, no good, no good. <laughs> fucking everyone I guess the horse was blocking the fucking trail they couldn't move the fucking horse all the people that were supposed to get to the boat it took them extra long to get there they get on they were all pissed off there was a picture I want to say it's in Racer X of me and Brian and Swinks just with his arms crossed all pissed off and I'm just sitting all pissed off on the boat going back and did, still, t- till the day he died, he would just say, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> Dude, we went to, a, just a quick one about Swingster. We went to Guy Cooper's house one time. We were at Coop's house, and he just got a brand new water truck. And Guy Cooper loved playing paintball. Yeah. Loved it. And it was Swingster, Mike Brown, Mike Craig... Larry Ward, Dean Baker, Dean Gibson was there. And guy comes out with his, all the gear. All right, you're the orange team, you're the blue team. Starts passing out and he goes, all right. He goes, one rule. Everything goes but one rule. And me and Swick are on the same team, so we have the same color pellets. One rule. Do not shoot that water truck. It's brand new. It's been here two days. All right, no problem. As soon as he, Coop takes off, he's hiding all over the place. Swings and starts unloading on the water truck, right? Comes back and Coop's going off. Swings all. I told him not to fucking do it. <laughs> totally fucking Cooper right there. said, get the fuck out of here. Dude, like we were staying at a Motel 6 in town in Stillwater that his family owned part of it. Yeah. And we were using their towels, you know, like the house, the towels for taking a shower with to wash our bikes and, you know, wash our hands off with grease and shit. Dude, later that night, fucking, they're out of here. You got an hour to get your shit and get the fuck out of town. Oh, really? He was so pissed. And I tried to talk to him still to this day, and he's just, you don't want nothing to hear from me. All over Swink's stupid ass. It's just paint, right? Like, doesn't it? Dude, exactly. But the thing was, even earlier in that day, uh, remember everyone was in it to the sight bike game in the semis? Yeah. I'm walking by in the you know, Yamaha Honda Choice semi and Mike Brown's playing it. And I kicked, I didn't pick my leg up over his cord and ripped the fucking thing out of his hand. Dude, and the dude went off. He got fired up like fucking someone just raped his daughter or something. Mike Brown? Mike Brown. Yeah. He fucking swings all, fuck him up, Brownie. Fuck him up. Fuck him up. Fuck that guy up. Like, just egging him on. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, you told me you were going to do that. 
he told me you were gonna, I'm just like, fucking swingster, dude. What the fuck are you doing to me? He's like, he, 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 like his little laugh. He's an instigator. He me. was always an instigator. Yeah, just, then there's way more stories over at his house, dude. That we would go there and he would get wasted. These guys would like, Paggio was the king of it. Swink would get so wasted that he'd, he'd like to get naked. And they would take chain lube with the nozzle on it, the extender, and put their foot on his butt, open his butt crack, and just spray contact cleaner <laughs> in his butthole. <laughs> Crazy. He, he would go, like, he would have everyone over, and around his jacuzzi, he had those plastic mats, you know, you put it around. Yeah. And he would go in there and let everybody in there for a little bit turn it upside down and crank the heater so it got so hot you had to jump out of it and your feet would get all like super soft from the heat and you would jump off and it had those fucking long plastic spikes on them just would work people dude uh yeah yeah we had a good time brian was a really unique dude yeah good guy i mean totally misunderstood and Man, he, he he had it rough, too. A lot of people don't realize, you know, what went down with his family as well. Um, you know, his dad pretty much committed suicide right in front of him. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's, there's some really... When he bad. was younger? No. Oh. He was older. I mean, he was still... He might have been... Done, yeah, he might have been done racing. But it was kind of heavy the way it went down, you know. It's not my place to talk about it, but... He, he had demons, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just sad we lost break? those guys. Yeah, yeah. Stay, stick test. around. We're going to take a quick break, guys. This is your TLD timeout. We'll be right back. There's a new product on the market that's going to help you with your riding and racing, and it's Elevate Action Sports. If you've not yet gone and checked it out at elevateactionsports.com, it's a collective of riding coaches, the likes of which has never been put together. Grant Langston, Ryan Hughes, Jeff Emick, Johnny Campbell, and myself, David Pingree, bringing all of our years of experience in professional racing to one place with professionally produced videos and all kinds of supporting staff to help you with your mental side of racing, your physical side, your bike setup, your bike maintenance. We cover it all. Get to Elevate Action Sports right now and join the community. There's a reason every AMA championship in the past decade was won on Dunlop tires. They are the best. Choose the best performing tire and a brand that has never wavered in their support of our sport. Choose Dunlop. Pro Circuit. Pro Circuit products are designed with one goal in mind, winning. Through passion and hard work, Pro Circuit has operated the most successful 250 team in the history of the sport. They use that same formula when developing exhaust, engine, and suspension parts for every brand. When only the highest level of performance is acceptable, trust Pro Circuit. Since 2009, Seat Concepts has been dedicated to making the best aftermarket seats. More comfort, more grip, more riding. For 10 years, we've continued to raise the bar. Innovation and American craftsmanship make Seat Concepts the world-leading manufacturer of power sports seats. Something from nothing. That's what Nihilo Concepts is about. It starts with a spark, an idea, a concept, which leads to a design and finishes with engineered excellence with the highest quality products created with durability in mind. All our products are made in the USA at our state-of-the-art facility in Stewart, Florida. Whether you are a weekend warrior, ride for fun, or at the highest level of competition, Nihilo Concepts offers innovative titanium, aluminum, and carbon fiber parts for your dirt bike. We offer a wide variety of products that you can customize to your liking. Browse our site for foot pegs, brake tips, engine components, specialty tools, frame grip tape, lever grips, carbon fiber components, motor stands, our secondary on-switch plus much more. 
Head to NihiloConcepts.com and see for yourself why factory teams like Red Bull KTM, Rockstar Husqvarna, Troy Lee Designs Gas Gas, Orange Brigade, Club MX, KLM Gas Gas, and some of the fastest riders in the world choose Nihilo Concepts. Specialized Bicycles. Specialized leads the way in the world of bicycling. Whether it's cross-country racing, downhill, e-bikes, enduro, road, gravel, dual slalom, dirt jumping, or all mountain bikes that do it all, Specialized has the perfect ride for you. The brand is synonymous with engineering excellence and innovation that steers the industry. Visit your local Specialized dealer for a test ride and see just how good Specialized products are. With a rich history in motocross, ProX has been dedicated to supplying quality components since 1975. Whether you're rebuilding an engine or just need a new chain, ProX Racing Parts aims to bridge the gap between OE quality and affordability. ProX has over 9,000 part numbers and over 60 different product types that are manufactured by highly reputable or even OEM suppliers and are offered at affordable prices to help keep riders on the bike instead of in the garage. Visit ProX.com to search parts for your bike or check them out at your favorite online or local dealer. Audio Jungle. The guys are just breaking in their race bikes, which will leave on the semi this Saturday to go to the first Supercross for our coast in Orlando. Uh, so the guys are just be goofing off a little bit, do some cool photos, do some cool videos. When you go racing, you want to do well, but a big key is keeping the bikes on the track. That's why we chose to work with Motul. Expectations coming in as a rookie is just to try and get my feet wet and uh, honestly just send it, see where I end up and uh, do my best out there, but just ride aggressive and ride like myself in practice and uh, I should have a good time. Challenges of this sport I believe is just simply staying healthy. Uh, with how fast we're going um, and what we're doing, your margin for mistake is really, really small. Stay sick. If you have little rippers, then you have had to have seen Stay Sick Bikes by now. We have created bike and experiences that allow kids to develop sooner and empower them to find their own ride. From learning to ride to sharpening skills, the Stay Sick promise is accelerated growth. Whatever path your family chooses, it's going to be the ride of your life. Stay Sick Stability Cycles. I'm on vacation every single day cuz I love my occupation. Hey, 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 I'm on vacation. If you don't like your life, then you should go and change it. Hey, hey, hey. All right, welcome back. That was our Troy Lee Designs timeout. And if you guys haven't been over to TLD, uh, their website lately, go check out what they've got going on. Uh, new gear, helmet paint, uh, mountain bike stuff if you're into that, all kinds of stuff. Uh, stoked to have them on on board and um, they make rad stuff. So check them out. Uh, Kenny, let's dive back into 98. You were still with Moto Triple X at this time, right? Correct. And who you had Phil Lawrence that year? No, 99. Oh, that was 99. Who was 98? 98 was James Eichel. Okay. Paul Curry. Brian Deegan. And Swingster. And Mike Metzger. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Started out with those guys, and then Metz ended up getting hurt. He didn't ride any Supercross, and he was going to go ride the one race outdoor at Glen Helen in the first round, and he got run over. And do you remember that his back, where he smoked his back, where he has that big burn on his back? Oh, I don't he remember. got roosted by one of my old riders, Ray Crum. He got caught underneath the bike, and the tires just burned up, put a hole in his back, like fist size. You can put it through. Jeez. So, yeah, that, and then, uh, yeah. You said that was a rough year, though. Yeah, it was. It was it was super gnarly. I mean, we struggled the whole way on bike setup, and then halfway through in Atlanta, someone broke into our van after I told Gothic to park it up against a light pole, but he was too into going out to some Gothic club. And uh, <laughs> next thing I know, I'm in the lobby of the Fairfield Inn eating breakfast, and I see 
this little skinny guy full of powder with underwear on with his Doc Martens up to his knees yelling, they got everything, they got everything. I'm all, huh? Someone broke into the box van, stole everything but James Eichel's golf clubs and the 55 gallon drum of fuel in the tent. Everything else gone. All bikes, everything, gear, gone. Mm. But if you go back and you watch that race, Deegan, Curry, and Eichel all raced. On what? Borrowed bikes. Deegan rode a Yamaha or Suzuki. Paul Curry rode a pro circuit bike, one of Mitch's bikes. And Eichel rode a Honda, I believe, from Duff. And it was just all borrowed gear. But after that... Um, Never got any of it back? Yeah. Good story. We did. Curry got his bike back, and Deegan got his bike back. And they got impounded. They were in a yard somewhere that we had to go pick up. But the insurance paid for their bikes. So they got their bikes in, and Eichel was so upset. He was literally in tears going, that's not fair. They got paid for insurance money and got their bikes back that they could sell and make money, and I got screwed. I only got the money. Like I'm just like, shut up, dude. He's like, I always get fucked. I'm like, oh, poor guy. <laughs> but, yeah, so that that happened, and then after that, we, you know, we rebuilt, got it going, and, of course after having that great successful year, I thought it'd be a great idea to put big boards in the Cowies. It didn't work out too good. They were, they ran worse. Yeah. And, uh, we were at round two, I believe, or three at Mount Morris and Brian's bike broke. He was on a Cowie and he was in the front going over Bradshaw Boulevard and the thing locked up and he, he was super pissed. He pushes it back. Um, so we do a fire drill. Uh, Yulikowski was his, Sean Yulikowski was yep. his mechanic. So me and Sean teamed up on it to get it, take it apart, get, you know, top end, whatever we had to do. And I drained the coolant right away. And he was pulling the carburetor off and he found out that just the reeds got sucked through. Oh. So they put a new reeds in, started, it was fine. He takes off, Brian takes off through the moto. He's probably 10th place, you know, whatever, doing decent. The bike stalls, brakes again. He's so fucking pissed. He, it broke, you know, the step down where the start is, mm -hmm. where James Cartwheel, mm -hmm. it seized right there going down. So he just fucking th threw the bike down, he was walking back up the hill. All the spectators are there by the fence. Some dude hands a beer over the fence to Brian. He pounds the beer, takes a couple more steps, and just launches his helmet. People are watching the race looking forward, and the helmet's coming over this way. So people f that worked with us flipped out. They're like, you know, he can't act like that. Our, supposedly our sponsors were pissed. Kurt told me that Brian had to write a letter apologizing for his actions. I think I remember hearing about this. So I told Brian, hey, you got to write a letter if you, you know, or you're going to have to sit out a couple of races. What do you think he told me? <laughs> Go pound sand is what he I He told mean. me, fuck you. I'm not writing no apology letter. I quit. All right, good luck, bro. Mm -hmm. All right, Kurt, I talked to Brian. What did he say? He told me to fuck off and he quit. Okay, cool. That was it. Yeah. And uh, he quit, and he went and did his thing. <clears throat> All right, what about 99? You, you had just factory? Yeah, so what happened was uh, I did factory. Uh, the team was, like, a little down, down on funds because we did four guys, and we were just going to do Supercross only. And since we were already going there, we might as well just do two guys out of a truck. You know, it was low expense. And we just told, you know, the 125 guy, like, hey, we'll take your bike. We'll pay for all the expenses. But all you got to do is get yourself there. We'll pay for your mechanic. And that was Travis Preston. Hmm. So 
he did that. He hired Yulika, we hired Yulikowski to be his mechanic because he work already worked for the team. Um, and I worked for Phil. I was Phil's mechanic again, and that's when he was going out with uh, Honey Chantel. Yep, <laughs> stripper. A, yeah, and that was the chick that would go by RLs and say, "Honey, honey, where's the key go <laughs> on the bike?" So, uh, honey, <laughs> and Phil was like, they would. They were, he wasn't doing too good that time of his life, I don't think. And no. he was partying a lot and doing stuff. And he was making mains and, and riding decentness on his ability and his talent. And then it started going downhill bad. And he was going for still the top privateer. That was the goal. Like, dude, you could win, you know, an extra 50 grand if you win the top privateer award. You know, you just got to put a little bit of effort into it, dude. A little yeah. bit. He's like, all right, K-Dub, we'll do it. And I go, okay. So he didn't put any effort. Like, I'd be in the, we'd share a room. I can't remember in St. Louis. Him and Dave would go to the fucking casino, dude, and come back into the room at like five o'clock in the morning, reeking like booze. I'm just like, he goes, I'll be okay. I'll be. He goes, I can sleep for five hours. I'll be, and he would show up at the race, and he started battling with Heath Voss, dude. And that's when Heath Voss was not good. Yeah. That's when I started to put on the pit board. Voss is your boss, you know. And uh, I just told Phil, dude, grips and graphics from here on out, dude. I'm not busting my ass no more, and work my ass off to build you a bike every week if you're not going to give it a shot. I'll just do a, a stadium tour and eat hot dogs and judge him. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, I don't blame you, K Dub. So to this day, dude, he apologizes to me. Yeah. I'm sorry, dude. You know, Phil. I'm sorry. I was an idiot. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, we did that. And then the uh, rest of the season for Triple X, uh, Travis did really well outdoors. He was top privateer. And uh, he went on to get a Honda factor uh, did that next year. Him and Yuli went to Honda. She went to yeah. uh, was a factory connection. Hmm. So we did our job as a team, helping them get it. And after that, um, 2000 is when Alan Brown stepped in at Triple X and took that whole program under. That's when uh, the whole they they teamed up with uh, Brad from Bakersfield or out there, and they got the Fun Mover and Larry Ward rode for the team on the 250F and you know all that stuff. And then uh, Kyle, I think Kyle Lewis started being a team manager and stuff like that yeah but after that i was done i was uh, i checked out at triple x and so you wound up at plano right that was your next yeah, thing what how did that come around summer of 99 i got hired by plano to start hiring riders and build their team and a gentleman named steve wagner who owned the dealership um got referred to me from wyatt wyatt seals um they wanted wyatt to do it but wyatt didn't want no part of it and hooked me up with it. And it was a good job, man. It was good money. And uh, I had an opportunity to, you know, do like I did with Triple X, but at a much bigger scale. And uh, there was support from Honda. And uh, it was kind of cool because that was the first year, I believe, of Factory Connection. And we would go up against them and they had to run, they, they were like the, factory Honda 125 team so they had to run that that new engine mm. and Mitch did our stuff with the 95 yeah good cylinders and bikes sounded good and they were fast yeah so we went out and we hired uh, four guys we hired uh, Ivan Geo Travis Elliott and this kid named Justin Smith and uh Went and did that year with them, building, building. In the next year, uh, it was Ivan, Casey Johnson, Dostal, and Billy Payne, which I thought was a pretty good lineup if all those guys were healthy. Yeah. But once again, Casey got hurt right away. Dostal was the only guy that didn't get hurt, but he was doing his thing, and he was Mr. Consistent, eighth place. He got yeah. a podium the year before, though, didn't he? Yeah. 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 Jerry's a good rider, man. Yeah. So, yeah, that was uh, that was it. And then, uh, what was it, 2002, we started out, and I seen the writing on the wall. Uh, 
Sheik was riding for the Sheik rode for the team outdoors that year. He came back from Europe and I hired him because um, with, with injuries like uh, I think it was Casey, he couldn't race the rest of the year, so I hired Scott and uh, we had a pretty good lineup. It was uh, Billy Payne who was decent that year and Ivan and Sheik. They yeah. did pretty good. And then 2001, it started to come around, and it was just not working out. Like, I, money was getting short, and the dude was, like, he had a parts account with Honda, like, for the dealership. Mm. And, like, let's say you had a Goldwing and you needed a fairing. He would order the fairing on credit and then, you know, pay for the fairing once he got the bill paid. Well, he was so he owed Honda so much money from spending money from the dealership that they wouldn't even give him, you know, it was COD all the time now on all his parts. Mm. So it was a struggle, dude. And I'd just seen it, and there was times, like, where he couldn't make payroll, and I just said, don't worry about me. Just make sure the guys get paid. They got bills. And I went months without getting paid because mm. I was worried about other people once again. So I did that, and then uh, I got an opportunity through Kerry. Um, Mickey Diamond was man tour managing the Vans Warp Tour. Do you know? Do you know I rode for them in two thousand two? Yeah, you remember that at the end. She got hurt. Yeah, and so he was ma- he was you managing rode, when you you rode the silver bike, right? The, the Shark Energy. Shark Energy. Yeah, that dude hosed us. Mm. He what, the, what happened with Shark Energy, and there was only one other team out there with a, with a Energy, and it was Red Bull. Hmm. And what happened was, it was a distributor that was distributing Shark Energy, and the owner of the company was called <clears throat> Osaswa, and they were from Indonesia. They were the Coca-Cola there. Huge, 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 big band. Well, they were paying this guy, and the guy ended up being like a full party guy, he came from the music industry, and uh, all the money that they gave him to pay the team and do everything, he never paid the team. And the dude ended up killing himself. Mm. I mean, there was another funny story is Bob Walker and Jimmy Button, when they had the, what was it called, syndicate or their business when they were agents yeah. together, Yeah, I gave them their first deal to put together, and that was with Shark Energy, with Jimmy and... Bob, because Bob worked in Phoenix for like uh, AT and T or something, and in, in the, he worked for the uh, PGA Tour, mm. doing like marketing and yeah. stuff like that. But uh, yeah, that, that ended up you know going away, and I Mickey was tour managing the Warp Tour, and he ended up going racing or doing something, and they needed Probably a guy. Supermoto by that point, huh? And uh, uh, Kerry called me. And said, hey, dude, we need a guy. Um, no, I take that back. It wasn't the Warp Tour yet. It was uh, Boom Boom Huck Jam. Okay. And I went and I tour managed that thing. And that was like a rock festival on wheels. Did that for two, I did that for two years. Um, and then I did the Warp Tour. Um, I, did the, I ended up doing the Warp Tour even though when I was working at Plano in the summertime. I would never go home. I would leave the races and fly to wherever the Warp Tour was and mm. then fly out and go back and forth. Mm. So I did that. And then uh, my friend Jim Hartman, once again, that did the Utopia thing or did Swatch Guards, started Utopia Sunglasses. And he was, you know, he loved Moto himself and he wanted to get involved. And he hired me to come in and to brand kind of be the brand ambassador for Utopia and get the name out there and build a team and help with, you know, designing the goggle and all that. And uh, I did that for shit. In like 2007, 2006 or 2007, I did it. And uh, in 2006, I started working for Tyler Evans exclusively. Like, that's all I did. And I was his agent, his manager, his... Whatever I had, I mean, I was at his beck and call to do whatever he needed, and uh, he was going downhill at that time. He was partying a lot, and what happened to him? You know, he would he 
he was so fast at a point, yeah, you know, like yeah. he was really good. And then speaking of a rough upbringing, perfect example, like I think at like 13 or 14, he went away to like juvenile hall. He fucking tried to kill his dad with a shovel. Um, and uh, him and his dad never really had a good relationship. Mm. And, uh, his dad was the nicest guy in the world. You know, you ever seen him at the races? He looked oh, yeah. Mr. Clean. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I started working for Tyler, and it was right after he was working with Hollywood when he did the Tommy Hilfiger thing. He was supposed to get all that money and never got a penny. And he came to me, and that's when Rockstar was first coming on the scene. And uh, we went to Rockstar and got like a hundred grand from Rockstar to sponsor Tyler. And they were just starting to sponsor Suzuki. And uh, they were telling me that they were going to get Tyler a factory bike and all this. And I was telling Kelso, first time I met him, you're not, he's not getting a factory bike. He's like, you you can't say that. And he goes, oh yeah, I'll get him a factory bike from Roger. Like we're the title sponsor. I go, it doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't work like that. Just because he's like, oh yeah, it'll, it never happened. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we pretty much got into an argument, me and that guy, the first time I met him, and we're cool. Me and Kelso are super tight now. But uh, that year, I, I got him fly racing, you know, for a lot of money, and I got him close to, like, six hundred grand Jeez. for two years. You know, he's making $300,000 a year. You know, that's when he went out and bought the Bentley and showed up in fucking suits and put all the dollar bills in the briefcase and was throwing it into the crowd. And I'm just like, oh, God. He did this whole thing, you know, and I backed him, you know. I was like, fuck, it need, the sport needs a, a, a guy to hate or love. Mm-hmm. And uh, he ended up having injuries, and he decided to quit racing, and he went down to Florida to start. He was thought he was going to be a UFC, I mean, an MMA fighter. Not an MMA, I'm sorry. A, WWF a, or something. Yeah, right? a wrestler. Yeah. Somehow, I don't know how this happened. He got hooked up with Hulk Hogan. Okay. And he wanted, started to go to the Hulk Hogan as a training facility for up and coming wrestlers. They really liked his look and they were going to make him into a wrestler because he was an athlete. And he started to buy into that. And his addiction just took off when he was down there. And uh, what, what was he taking pills? Pills. Yeah. And. I was working for Kerry, and he hated Kerry because he thought when we started RCH, Rockstar dropped him because of his results and all the other bullshit. And Rockstar picked up Hart and Huntington, you know, so he thought I represented Kerry now and that I fucked him and I didn't go to bat for him and I didn't have nothing to do with it. They dropped him and they said, hey, we'd like to sponsor Kerry Hart. And I'm just like, no problem. We can make it work. So he was pissed about that. His dad ended up, um, got sick, and he called me, and he asked me for like $5,000 for a plane ticket and travel money and stuff like that. And I told him, I said, Tyler, I'm not going to send you money, but I'll send you a plane ticket, and if you need help, I'll fucking make sure you get all the help you need and, and help you in the right direction. And... I said, email me your information, where you want it, and you want a ticket. And I never heard from the guy. So I was living in Vegas. Um, I got a car that J-Star let me borrow for X Games. I think it was 2000. It was 2012. And I went to go return it, and he was at J-Star. And I walked in, and it was like the showroom was crowded full of people. And I walk in and I see him there and I'm like, hey, what's up? Like, I even think nothing was wrong. I'm all, he's like, really? You're going to come up to me like we're all cool? Fuck you, you're a little bitch. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, and he goes, you think I'm joking? And I put my head down and he just fucking cold cocked me mm. and hit me right dead square in the eye and gave me the biggest fucking shiner. And there was a cop that was buying a car that was off duty. He's like, dude, I seen the whole thing. You want me to press charges? And he's outside the door. Just going, come on, come on, I'll fucking kill you. And I was like, fuck it, let's do it, you know. And the cops all, no, don't go out there. Jared's like, just let him go. So to make a long story short, the cop, I did press charges. I let him go. From that day on, pretty much until the day that he died, he was just, 
an asshole threatening me, calling me, calling me a bitch. I'm a little pussy. Next time he sees me, he's going to whoop my ass. Finally, I'm just like, dude, enough's enough. Fucking, where do you want to go? Like, let's do it. Like, I'm done. Like, he's not that tough. He's not as tough as he says he is. I mean, just what he did. One punch. Yeah, he cold cocked me. You know, then he tried to do the hockey move and pull the shirt over me. And I'm by no means, I'm not like this bro- fucking fighter guy. But growing up, I got the shit kicked out of me on a daily base. So getting beat up is nothing to me. Like, so I'm like, fuck it. You know what I mean? But I know better when you fight a dirt bike rider, there's no bothering him either. Like, you guys crash your brains out. You're going to beat someone up. You're not going to do anything to him. Yeah. So he just kept bugging me, and I had to do what I had to do. And I had some people go talk to him and warned him if he keeps bothering me that they're going to, you know, tell that they said, tell me that you're going to leave him alone. And if you don't leave him alone, you lie to us, and we're going to come handle you. So that was it. Didn't hear from him again. And the next thing I know, people are calling me going, did you see YouTube? Did you see Evans? He fucking got killed by the police. I'm all, huh? And the crazy thing is, it's on YouTube. They shot him? I thought he shot himself. No. No. He hmm. had a gun and he wouldn't put the gun down. Hmm. And they all they kept calling him, Taylor, put the gun down. Taylor, put the gun down. What are you doing? Put the gun down. Because what happened was, the girlfriend he had at the time, he used to beat the fuck out of him. And she pressed charges against him the night before for beating him up. And he told her, you go to the police station and you drop the charges. Else I'm going to fucking get you worse. So she was like frightened. She goes, okay, okay. So she goes to the police station. They park in the parking lot of the police station downtown LA. She goes in and she knew he had a gun and told the cops what happened, and that he has a gun. So right there, it was game on. Yeah. And he didn't put the gun away, and he was like, I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. And he kept walking towards him. And oh, yeah, that's... That's the way it ended for him. But uh, it just sucks that it had to go that way, because at, at one point, before it all happened, he was a good fucking dude, man. Hmm. Good guy. Had a heart of gold. And then everything started, all this... Money went to his head like he was, you know, he made good money, but it was only for two years and it wasn't like he was, you know, a millionaire and had all this. And he just started to fool himself who he was hanging out with and he's going to be a rapper and this and that. And you know what? At the end of the day, he was just a normal dude that rode a dirt bike. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. You People would tell me he'd go to they would meet people down in Hollywood where he hung out and he would tell people that he was a motocross champion, you know, to fit in. And But, hey, you know what? To each his own. God bless him. I hope yeah. That. Well, it's just too bad. That's pills and bad influences, right? Yeah. Just, just another chapter of my life. Crazy fucking life of Kenny Watson. Yeah, you definitely lived it. What about uh, Hart and Huntington then? Tell me how that thing kind of got going. I, I remember... I want to say it was one of the first rounds of that first season. I remember I walked over and he had the girls dancing on boxes in the edge of the Well, thing. how it started was the duels at the dock. Do you remember that race? I won. And congratulations. Yeah. And uh, that's when Carrie's TV show was just pumping. Oh, uh, inked. Inked. Mm-hmm. And like they had merchandise and they were selling the fuck out of it. And there was just literally three to 400 people around them at all times. And I'm standing back just watching going, can you imagine this at Supercross? Like, how much people he draws? And we went back to Vegas, and we used to go to lunch at the Spearmint Rhino, like two or three days a week. They have the the businessman special, a steak and a lap dance for (laughs) 20 bucks. (laughs) And uh, I brought it up to him. I go, hey, we should do a Supercross team. And he goes... You're fucking crazy. He's like, dude, I'm not putting my money. I work way too hard and broke way too many bones to put it into a team like that. He goes, put it, he goes, I'll make you a deal. If you could raise the money, you put a budget together, you show me what the budget is, and you raise all the money, I'll put my name to it. But I'm not putting any money into it. I'm telling you right now. 
I'm not putting any money into it until contracts are signed and I know I'm getting it back. I said, okay. So that's when I went to work. That was, uh, you know, when was the duel in the docks? It was like September or something? 06. Uh, yeah, it was 06. It was the, towards the end of the summer. Oh, yeah, it was the end of summer. Yeah, so I remember uh, oh, the next year, um, I went with Donnie and we did the Supermoto thing. And Evans was still there. You know, Evans rode on the Supermoto team, if you remember, a couple of races. I don't really remember that, but all right. He had his... He rode on the team until the box until the truck burned down. I remember that. Okay. Okay, but uh, we did the team, and I went out and I raised all the money. From whom? Rockstar. Who else was playing? Rockstar. In? Rockstar flipped a major part of the bill. What I was think, the exhaust company? Because those uh, were the smoke machines, right? You had like the mufflers. Giovinci. And, oh, that's right. Yeah, them. They paid, you know, six figures. Rockstar. Fox, you know, like Hart used to call them the, the little sponsors that would pay 10 grand, you know, 10 of them was 100 grand. You know, we had all those, so we, we raised the money. And we didn't pay the riders, paid their expenses. That was it, and it paid the mechanics. We got bikes from a dealer and returned them, or we financed them and sold them and made a little bit of money if we needed more bikes. And uh, Hart saw, hey, you know what? We're not going to win on the track. We're going to win in the pits. We're going to put on a presentation that people are going to fucking remember forever. They might not remember who got third place two years ago, but they're going to remember their experience walking through the pits. And it was it was true. I mean, at the time, it, which I suppose it would still be a spectacle, but it was like you stopped and went like, whoa. What's going on in here? <laughs> oh, I remember our truck driver, Jerry. <laughs> it was a mix between a strip club and, and a garage. You know. And get sawed and put sawed out and rocks and plants and, dude, make it look bitching. You know, we had that custom DJ bill, DJ booth that Giovin, Giovanni, whatever it's called. Leo, Leo Vince. Leo right. Vinci built with the exhaust smoke stacks coming out of yeah. it. And, dude, we used to have, like, the Cottonmouth King guys come and DJ. Dude, it was, it, that happened for... You know, the first year we raced was 08. We started at the end of 07 was the U.S. Open was our debut, and DeMuth got third. Him and Weimer, Weimer won the overall. No, I take it back. Weimer won the, the last night. Josh had to beat Weimer for the overall. Langston and him tied in points, and Langston got the overall. Uh, huh. So, so There's another guy... Josh DeMuth, another guy we lost. Yeah, fuck. A lot of people that... Yeah, dude, that guy, man. I remember that the next year at the U.S. Open, he was a reader cross guy, so he rode that stuff pretty good, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. And, he was uh, a multi, multi-timer multi in the costume. And we signed Josh DeMuth for that 90, for the 2008 series. And he was going to ride for Hart Huntington the whole season. And... He shows up for his first race, contracted rider to come race, and Hart Huntington's a local team, so the news wanted to do you know all kinds of stuff around us. So we had early morning. We got the track early in the morning, and I told Josh, I said, "Hey, we're gonna do media at like six in the morning. You got to be here ready to go in gear, ready to go." His mechanic, I don't know if you know, his name's Chad Gebe. Hmm. And uh, Chad had the bike all dialed. We're ready to go. Me and Chad are out the truck waiting. And here comes DeMuth with his roller bag, full gear, walks up. Hey, Bob, what's up? And I look at him, dude, and I'm all, dude, you're doing one or two things. You either staying up helping the drywall crew last night or you were fucking whiff and blow all night. He had white rings <laughs> around his nostrils. <laughs> Shut up. I swear to you, bro. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, bub. You know, just how it is, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, where'd you find the blow when you... He got in he got in at like 11 o'clock the night before. You know, a normal guy would just go to the hotel, check in, go to sleep, wake up. He fucking stayed up blowing rails all night. He shows up. He fucking rides press day. I'm just like, oh, this is not going to work out. And then I'm talking to him before he rode press day, and I'm like, dude, how, how'd you find blow... He goes, oh, I, I taped an ounce underneath my nutsack. 
I'm like, oh my god, dude, unbelievable. So he was gonna stay. <laughs> he was, he was staying at my house. Like he went and raced and he got smoked and he's like, I sucked. I don't, what do you think I was gonna do? You know, I said, I I get it. And we were doing our photo shoot in like December, and there was this jump on our Supercross track that no one did. And I said, Josh, everybody, do not do that jump. No one's done it. You guys are on stock bikes for a photo shoot. Please, no one, everyone be careful. Sure enough, I see him eyeballing it. And I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. Sure enough. Case the fuck out of it. Snap both of his wrists. Done. That's when we hired Cole Seawork. Mm. That was it. <laughs> what was the biggest thing? Just a one night. I guess Deal, so. Or was, do you think if he would have stayed healthy, he'd have been good that season? Don't know. I don't know. Hard to say. Yeah. Um, well, kind of like exactly what you said, like your results weren't great there for a while. I mean, you had, I was looking through the guys you had, uh, Hanny, DeMuth, Tedesco, Cole you know, Siegler. You know who did really good and did it very quietly, but was he threw in a, a couple of really good rides was Josh. He hurt his ankle, yeah. I, I remember Dallas Supercross where he got fifth and he should have got on the podium. He was riding so good. Yeah. That guy was so good. He still rides. You watch him ride still. He's, He's got to be 40, right? I don't know. Probably close to it if that. And he still looks like a 20 year old kid out there. Yeah. Uh, Troy Adams, Josh Hill, Blos, Partridge. Am I missing anyone else? Like, you guys had a pretty long list of guys throughout the years that. Yeah, Ivan. I got him on here. Yeah, hot sauce. Did you say... Uh, Troy Adam, you got Troy? I got Troy. Yeah. Dude, out of all those guys on that list, who do you think gave us the best result in the 450 class? Partridge. Nope. No? Not Hanny? Nope. Hot sauce? Blos, fourth at Vegas Supercross. That year where Wyndham and um, Wyndham flatted, and remember James crashed, and Wyndham was gonna Wyndham flatted. I want to say it was. I don't remember any of that. Two thousand and eleven. Hanny got fourth, or uh, Blos got fourth. Blos got fourth. Our best finish ever. Matt Bonney. Oh, Matt Bonney, I remember that. Name. Huh. That's crazy. But you guys did. I mean, I would say you guys changed the game in terms of yeah. uh, activation I mean, at the races. The Dodge setup. When Dodge came aboard, we were making a lot of money, dude. Really? The team was making a lot of money. Dude. I mean, we were making a few million dollars in sponsorship, Supercross only. Are you saying netting? Like you were making that much or bringing that much in? That's how much we brought in. But remember, we only did Supercross. Yeah. We had two semis. Yeah, but what were you spending? I mean, were you, was Hill. it a break even at the end of the year? Oh, it was profit. Hmm. That's wild because that doesn't happen. No, it was. If, if it anyone was, has any money left over at the end of a season, it goes back into, yeah, hey, it was, the truck it was, needs this or, was, or let's buy this, you know. No, it was, it was total. It was We made money. It was profit. And that's the, crazy. The crazy thing about the whole deal was. When Ricky came to us, it was more uh, you know, like when Hart told him, you know, what our finances were, he was blown away. How much money? Because I'm at, sure. at one time, dude, we had Dodge, we had Saquon, and we had another casino, Soaring Eagle, all at one time. We had two casinos, an East Coast one and a West Coast one hmm. for three years. Mm. Um, tell me about the transition when Ricky came in. Like to me, it seems, I guess it makes sense in hindsight because you guys did have, um, seemed like all the marketing components there. Yeah. You just needed maybe the technical side. Yeah. So what happened, better rider, you know? so what happened on the technical side was Ricky came in, he saw that, that that's where we were, you know, a little weak at. So he sold it. He knew that, you know, what we were doing, and he said, we need to hire better people. 
if we're going to do the Suzuki thing. So he went and he hired Mark Johnson to kind of be the liaison, not to be the team manager, but to, to train the team manager. So we met, Mark Johnson, myself, Carrie, and Ricky met at a, near uh, LAX at a restaurant, and they sat me down and told me that Mark was going to be my mentor, and I told him that I didn't want to be the team manager. I think Kyle would do a way better job than I would, Kyle Bentley. Um, and Kyle Bentley at this time was a practice bike mechanic for the team. He was like the crew chief type of deal. But And uh, I just said, you know, it's a good position for Kyle. He would do a really good, better than I would do. And uh, so Kerry and them agreed. And what we did was we split it. We got another semi. Mark didn't want everything under one roof. We had a hospitality truck for activation, marketing, and hospitality, and then a race truck. Um, that that was kind of a, a weird deal because it kind of separated the two. It was like them against us type of deal at some scenario, and like people weren't feeling comfortable walking into certain trucks and stuff like that. But uh, you know, Mark definitely brought a lot of wisdom yeah. to the program, and. Uh, once he got involved, um, you know, Kerry had me, you know, everything that he taught me and all the marketing and the activation we had under control. Hmm. Um, how was that to win a championship with that team? Did that, did that mean uh, a lot to you, Ricky, Kerry? I think or it, at it that meant, point, did it matter? Like, does Ricky even care? He's already no, no, there. he cared. He cared. And... Um, he really thought, and we, that was before we, you know, we were, we came in there and Suzuki, Yoshimura was the, 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 the main guys at Suzuki. And when we went in there, they were pissed. Mike Webb was not happy because we were taking funding away from them. Mm -hmm. And James wasn't happy, but overall we were beating them week in and week out. Yeah. Um, not because we were James, our guys were faster, but you know, they were breaking and they were having issues and, you know, so when that was going on, you know, we, we really wanted to win and it was to get Kenny. It was, we were really, were just fortunate because it wasn't like he came to our team because it was so great. He came to our team because he was going to go ride at Honda and they re-signed Trey Right before Kenny was supposed to, Kenny, they didn't know that Kenny was going to be available. So they signed Trey for a two year deal. And Kenny wanted to go ride at Honda. So what we did was he was riding on our team for two years flat. If he won, and no matter what, he was leaving and going to Honda. Mm -hmm. So we knew that. So we just said, this is our opportunity to get that guy because we, there's no way we would, at that point in time, we were going to go get a top guy. It wasn't going to happen. You know, we weren't proven, you know. So for Kenny to win that title for us, it was pretty cool. Kerry was stoked on it, you know. Before Kenny got there, I mean, only the closest we got to the podium is when we walked past it. You know what I mean? Now, you know, we're, we're on the podium. I'll never forget. I mean, I, I think the first time we won, I was more amped than the championship for some reason. Yeah, well, but, uh, groundbreaking. Yeah, it, it, and it, towards the end... The, the championship was rad, but the writing was on the wall. There was some stuff that happened internally with the team, and some people got involved, and uh, a bunch of promises were made that never happened and kind of, you know, put us, you know, where it wasn't going to break even anymore. And Kerry still, you know, he put money into the team, but he always got paid back. Like when, our, like when, the, when the truck caught on fire, he went out and stroked a check for six hundred grand to buy a new trailer and replaced all the motorcycles that got burned down to every guy before insurance money even came. He paid everybody a week later for their bikes, mm. and you know he went out and bought a fucking you know a brand new truck, a tent. We I mean in one week we had a tent built and we had it wrapped and we had it done, in w no ten days, four X Games, mm. you know. And Kerry got paid back from the team for that. You know, and he wasn't, like he said, he said, I told you. And he told Ricky the same thing. This team is going to last as long as it pays for itself. 
because Ricky never put, a, you know, he put a little bit of money out of his pocket into the team and invested in it because Mark Johnson wanted such a high salary, we couldn't afford it. So Ricky made up for it. Mm. I think it was like 50 grand a year that Ricky paid Mark out of his pocket. But at the end of the day, when everything was split up after equity and all that, he made it. He made out well. Yeah. And and then why did it end? That was always well, a surprise. Because, because, because Kenny was leaving. No, that, that didn't matter. Kenny was leaving. I mean, we still, you know, we've been working with Brock Tickle the whole time, and Brock was showing a lot of potential. I mean, he. I remember, you know, at Redbud. I mean, him and Kenny went one two. Mm-hmm. I mean, Brock was doing really well, and uh, you know, it just. Uh, like I said, it was just there was some person that came in that, you know, like Carrie would say, drank drank the Kool Aid, and believed in you know all of the broken promises and, you know, if he did or didn't try to get him or whatever, you know, you can't make someone write a check, and uh, it didn't happen, yeah. and it was game over. <clears throat> That's a shame. Um, that was it. Between that time and now, what's what have you been doing? Kind of odds and ends. You said yeah, you kind of had some uh, depression going some, on. I've done, you know what I've been doing? I've done some consulting. Um, I thought I was going to start that one podcast and do that. But like I said, I, I got burned out of that. I was just uh, doing it on my own. And I just I just lost focus on everything. I've It really bummed me out. Um, you know, having that team for 12 years and being part of something that it was mine. I had really believed like, you know, I had ownership in it as well. And, uh, it was gone. It was done. It was over with. And I hit, I hit a little, uh, wet spot in the road with depression mm-hmm. and addiction. And, you know, I was asking myself, I was going, I was battling. That's when my whole upbringing really started to come around and start to think about, you know, everything. And, I really started to feel like I was shortchanged. My life was shitty. What my purpose? And uh, my purpose is to be a good dad yeah. at the end of the day. And I had to realize that more than anything that it's not about me anymore. It's about providing for that little girl and making sure that she's taken care of. Yeah. And let's quit whining and feeling sorry for yourself and just get back out there and do the best you can. So every day I wake up, I just try to be better than I was yesterday. And that's all I can do. That's awesome. Well, we're, we're out of time. Both of us have got to run. we got stuff going on. But uh, I want to get – I'm anxious for your podcast to get rolling and come on because I know we got more stories. There's more stuff I want to ask you about. But we'll get to that in your podcast. How about, how about next time I do a podcast and you're the, my guest on Inside the Rut? Sure. How about that? Yeah, I love it. Uh, we do have a last question we ask everybody. And that's how do you want to be remembered in this sport? What, what kind of legacy do you want to leave when you're when you walk away from it for the final time, whatever that is? In general, or for my loved ones and my family, or just for wonder. people to say? Just how would you like to be remembered? How do you want people to remember you? I would like to be remembered as someone that cared about others and wasn't self-centered and would give his shirt off his back to help somebody. Yeah. Dude, I, that, and I told you this earlier before you even mentioned that. That's how I, that's how I perceive you. There's been times, uh, I can't even think of a specific example, but I've seen a lot of people that needed your help and you don't hesitate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's, I mean, that's rare. Yeah. yeah and, I mean, and even if it, it is cost to you, you know, like you've said multiple times, yeah, I don't pay me, just take care of the guys. Yeah. That, I've seen that in you over the years a lot. Yeah. And that's bitten me in the ass quite a bit. You know, I look at it, you know, like when I was at RCH, there's so much stupid, shady shit that I could have done to benefit for myself, you know, with sponsors and what other people have done, other team managers and other people in my position where embezzle money and do all kinds of stupid, crazy shit. But that's 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 not me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't do that. And I was always worried, you know. It was crazy. When I was with Kerry Hart and I worked for them, I wanted to make him proud of me. Because at the time, 
he really took a chance on me and let me steer his ship. And I wanted him to give me approval like a dad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, he did. You know, he did. There were some things that I didn't agree on, but you know what? He was always the first one to say good job, thank you, you know, and appreciate, you know, everything that uh, opportunity that he gave me. I mean, I learned so much from him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's some things I don't agree on, but hey, you know what? It is what it is. That's life. And, uh, yeah. Like I say, when I get done with my podcast, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. There you go. Well, I'm stoked to be working with you, buddy. I'm glad to Me have too. you on the team. All right, buddy. And looking forward to what you're going to do. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back to wrap up the show. I was Kenny Watson. I want to be bad with you, girl, like we're robbing. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in today. That's our show. I wanted to just thank Kenny Watson for coming in uh, and being open and really, you know, just kind of laying everything bare. That's, that's how he rolls. Uh, it's what I love about Kenny. Uh, check his podcast out. It'll be out. Uh, first episode will be out by the time this episode comes out. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, be a good time and uh, maybe a little bit more loose than what we're used to here. But uh, I think that that's interesting and fun. So uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you to all of our sponsors. We, we go a long ways out of our way to make sure we only partner with premium brands so that I don't have to stress about representing anyone or telling you guys to go buy these products. They are premium elite level brands, period. Uh, you buy the people that these logos that are behind me, you're going to be, you're going to be happy with them. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in. As always, we've got great shows coming up. We'll see you next time. The Whiskey Throttle Show is brought to you by Yamaha. Join the Blue Crew today and take advantage of all that Yamaha has to offer, including amateur racing trackside support, awesome Yamaha contingency, Jason Rain's demos and instructional classes, and frankly, the most high-performing motorcycles available in the market today. Whether you're looking for a four-stroke, a two-stroke, a side-by-side, a quad, a boat, a generator, Yamaha prides themselves on absolute top-level quality and reliability. Rev your heart with Yamaha and join the Blue Crew today. Method Race Wheels, bringing you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off-road for your truck, van, sprinter, UTV, or SUV. They've been dominating the Baja 500 and 1000 and every major off-road event around the world for years with high quality and performance. They also look amazing. They come in a bunch of different styles and colors for your rig, so check them out. You can get 20% off a set of wheels using our code Whiskey Throttle. No capitals, no spaces. 20% off using our code. Check them out. Troy Lee Designs is the leader in off-road motocross apparel and style. So whether you're looking for a cool new paint job for your helmet, maybe your name and number on your helmet lettered on, you're looking for new gear, you're looking for mountain bike gear, off-road gear, they've got the brand new Scout line and GP and SE models. Troy Lee Designs has it all. They've been leading this industry for decades, and they're going to continue to do it. Check out TroyLeeDesigns.com. SKDA is a moto graphics and seat covers company with several offices based around the globe. For too long, bikes and graphics have all looked the same. They just start to blend together. SKDA is working to change that. With super clean and unique design work, a bike with SKDA graphics stands out in a crowd and adds a touch of art to the world of moto. Hey, we need that. SKDA prides itself on providing premium customer service both before and after the sale is made. Visit SKDA online to view the current product range and get in touch with their team to get your bike refreshed. I want to just make a a mention here that these guys, not only is their design way outside the box, very, very cool. They'll work with you on custom things. The the products are incredible, okay? They'll speak for themselves. But what's really awesome, and you'll notice this the minute you order one of these, man, they give you an email saying, hey, the product's been shipped. Uh, Hey, the product is here. It landed in this spot. Hey, it's coming today. Hey, your product's been delivered. They're just so good about staying in touch with you and letting you know where it's at. Customer service is 100%, and uh, that's just something that's rare these days. Check out SKDA. Here at the Whiskey Throttle Show, we're all about supporting brands that support our sport. And there's one tire company that has never walked away from the sport of motocross and supercross, and it's Dunlop. When times got tough and the economy took a crash, Dunlop stepped up and stayed with our sport to support it and the athletes and individuals that love it. Their MX-53 line and MX-33 lines absolutely dominate this sport. Every national championship at the pro level has been won in the last decade, and nearly every single amateur national championship at Loretta Lynn's has been won on a Dunlop. So if you're looking for high performance, you're looking for 
amazing quality, and you're looking to support a brand that never turns its back on our sport, there's only one choice for you, and it's Dunlop. Pro Circuit is the leader in aftermarket performance and quality. Whether you're looking for a little more horsepower out of your engine, some quality hard parts to improve the way your bike feels and looks, better handling through suspension or linkage or linkage arms, Pro Circuit is where you need to stop. It's your one-stop shop. You can go in there and get everything you need to make your motorcycle go from average to exceptional. Pro Circuit's got enough number one plates on their wall to side an entire home, and there's a reason for that. They're very, very good at what they do. Uh, the highest quality products with one goal in mind, and that's winning. Check out ProCircuit.com. Nihilo Concepts is leading the way in aftermarket hard parts. With their secondary on-switch device, something that was much needed in this sport, they've been innovating and bringing new products to market. Their latest is the new Nihilo Run Cool Brake Pistons. They're designed to be stronger than stock and provide exceptional cooling performance with less brake drag. Most OEM calipers pistons are made from aluminum that just can't hold it to the heat and extreme demands of serious racing. When they get hot, the aluminum will distort, causing loss of hydraulic pressure and brake failure. Nihilo's run cool pistons limit the area that boiling hot hydraulic fluid is able to come in contact with the piston, leaving two thirds of the piston volume in open air with breather holes to enhance the cooling ability. It's made of a proprietary stainless blend, which is better at dissipating heat. You have issues with brake fade or brake failure, check out Nihilo Concepts among their many amazing hard parts and carbon fiber parts and titanium. Nihiloconcepts.com. Seat Concepts is the leader in motorcycle saddles. If you're looking for a new cover or a new seat entirely, Seat Concepts is the place to go. They make custom seat foams catered to your height, weight, riding ability, riding type. They also have waterproof covers and, and foams that will not break down if you ride in a lot of inclement weather. And they pride themselves on being much more comfortable than OEM or any other aftermarket company. If you're looking for a new seat or a new cover, Seat Concepts, there's nothing better. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the Polaris RZR 800s. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the... If you've got a little Grom that's looking to get started in the motorcycle world, the best way to get them going is on a Stasic bike. They've got multiple sizes, so from your very young Groms to those who are a little more grown up, you can start them safely. They've got controls that allow you to control the speed so he can't get going too quick. They can touch the ground. There's not a lot of noise to distract them. It's the perfect way to get your child involved in motorcycling at a very young age. And if you've got a kid who's already out ripping, there's series popping up all over. For those of you in Southern California, go to www.ameminicross.com and join their local series. If you're outside of this state, contact your local track and ask them about starting a Stasic class at your local track. Get over to Stasic.com and check out all they've got going on. Motul USA, uh, we, we lean hard on these lubricants to keep us uh, on the track and on the trail. And Motul has proven their quality over and over, uh, most recently with their Dakar win with Ricky Brabeck. Uh, they're sponsoring Supercross teams. They're diving into our sport again full full throttle, and uh, we're stoked to have them on board. Amazing products, top to bottom. Motul USA, go check them out. And finally, last but not least, Specialized Bicycles. If you are in the market to start pedaling, this is where you want to start. Uh, they've got great entry-level bikes all the way up to the Cadillac, the new Levo um, e-bike, uh, any, anything in between, man. It doesn't matter what kind of riding you're doing. Go check out and start with Specialized. Don't waste your time on something that's going to break. The derailleur's not going to shift after a couple months. Get something quality. Uh, these guys make it. Specialized leads that industry.
Thanks for watching and listening to the Whiskey Throttle Show. Be sure to like and subscribe to get notified when new shows go up. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok. And visit whiskeythrottlemedia.com for additional content.